I think 10 minutes have passed. So I think we're going to start with processing in memory now. Is that a good goal? Uh, I was going to a simulation lecture also, but I think I'm going to defer that for later. Because we do a lot of simulation in general in computer architecture, and it's good to know simulation. How many of you have done simulation before? Simulation of like a processor or memory? Okay, not everyone, for sure. So it's something good to learn, I think. I'm going to reference some papers that do a lot of simulation because these things don't exist yet. Uh, and that could be very useful. Uh, but maybe I'll do the lecture later. It's a short lecture, actually, but if we do it, then we won't be able to cover this one. Okay, uh, so let's start with this one. So I think actually this is uh, a bigger lecture uh, than what we can cover in two hours. But essentially, what we've covered so far is major trends that are affecting main memory and other stuff after that. Uh, and we motivated the need for intelligent memory controllers from the bottom up. Basically, today, we're having a huge push from circuits and devices that actually uh, ask us to have better memory controllers. I think I've given you a lot of examples of that, right? By adding slightly more intelligence into the memory controllers, you can fix some of the circuit and device level reliability problems, security problems much more easily. Or maybe you're not able to fix them at the circuit level and device level today, right? And that's exactly why the Samsung and Intel paper is also arguing for co-architecting memory controllers and DRAM, essentially. To fix a refresh problem, you want to have an intelligent memory controller, I believe. So today we're in this interesting place where the bottom level reliability problems, efficiency problems, performance problems, and security problems are pushing us to have better memory controllers, intelligent memory controllers. I'm going to show you now that we're also squeezed from the top. Actually, maybe what we're squeezed from the top is even worse than the, what, what the bottom is pushing us. So essentially, uh, from the bottom, we're we, uh, we have constraints that are pushing us to have better controllers. From the top, top meaning system and application levels, we want better memory controllers. I don't think we have any choice as a result of this. So why am I telling this? Because this in-memory computation idea or processing in-memory, processing near data, I'm going to say that they're go going to be very similar from my point of view. Uh, it's not a new idea. It's actually a very old idea. Uh, if you think of analog computation in the past, it has its roots in analog computation. But the first paper on this idea, uh, okay, let me ask you the question. When do you think the first paper on processing in the memory in a more traditional system was written? Any guesses? I, I hear something. Say it again? 2015? No, 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 much older. I'm thinking of much older ideas. People have proposed processing in memory, processing inside a memory chip. A long time ago, actually. 1970s? 1970s? That's always a good guess. <laughs> 60s or 70s. Actually, you're right. Uh, the first paper is actually written in 1970 that I could find. Uh, it's written by Harold Stone. It's called The Logic in Memory Computer. It was published in IEEE Transaction on Computers. Uh, he developed the idea uh, earlier, of course, in the 1960s. Uh, and he has also a textbook. He, he was at IBM Research for a long time. He has also a computer architecture textbook if you're interested. So it's an old textbook. But, uh, but it never took off, actually. People wrote papers in the 70s, in 80s. Database systems, for example, they wanted processing in memory because things were slow for them at that time. Uh, in 90s, intelligent RAM, flex RAM. Probably a lot of people know the 90s work for whatever reason. Maybe they were better publicized but they don't know the 1970s work. It's actually a really old idea, uh, starting from uh, 1970 as the first paper that I know of. 2000s were a bit calm, I think. And then I think uh, more recently, it started taking off again. And it never took off, it never became commercial. Even though people actually looked at the built chips, uh, they, they, they were never commercialized. Uh, and you can ask the question why. I think uh, the environment was never ready. There are two reasons, in my opinion. The environment was never ready. Basically, we were not squeezed in the past. And whenever you want to have a big shift in paradigm, big change, you really want a good reason for it. And I think today we have that good reason because we have nowhere else to go, in my opinion. We have a big data movement. We have a big data bottleneck in systems. 
And data movement is a huge bottleneck. And if you want to solve that, essentially we should not move data. So we should find a solution to it. And I think processing in memory is a good solution. I think 3D stacking is another solution that's complementary to uh, processing in memory. But if you can reduce the data movement to minimal amounts, uh, that will solve a lot of the problems that we have. But I think at this point we have nowhere to go. Uh, and the other reason is um, if you look at the old processing in memory works, uh, I think they were proposing something that's relatively unrealistic, even today perhaps. They were basically proposing uh, a lot of the works, not all of them, uh, but a lot of the works were proposing taking a general purpose processor that's very heavy, uh, a very uh, high area cost, high performance, and they were proposing it to put it into, into inside a DRAM chip. Now there's a, d a downside to this because DRAM chip is really optimized for something else. That something else is really the capacitor. So the real big constraint is how do you make that capacitor as small as possible and access transistor also as, le as little leaky as possible basically. So that process is very different from the process, manufacturing process that's used for devising high performance circuits. So that's, that's uh, th there's a manufacturing dichotomy between memory and processing. So there's a real dichotomy in terms of manufacturing. If you want to build a very high performance transistor uh, at low cost, you cannot do it inside a DRAM chip. DRAM chip is optimized for the capacitor really. So past works were proposing, okay, let's put the processor inside the DRAM chip. I think that's going to be very, very hard. You may put some limited amount of logic, but it's not going to be an extremely high performance processor inside there. So I think uh, we should be looking at different directions in terms of processing in memory. I'm going to talk about two different directions. What can we do minimally inside the memory chip without disturbing the, uh, uh, what the memory chip is designed for a lot? And how can we adv uh, take advantage of new technologies that didn't exist while all of those wor other works were being done? Uh, and how can we take advantage of that? There's also an opportunity, I think, to do a little bit more inside the memory chip, but it's not going to be like putting a high performance out of order core inside uh, the memory chip, in my opinion, going forward. It's going to be very difficult to do that. Because that's, uh, once you put a high performance core inside the memory chip, it becomes low performance actually, because the transistors designed the memory chip are not very good, because the, it's not designed for a high performance transistor. And also energy efficiency is very low for that transistor. Uh, yeah, very low, it's very leaky. Uh, and also cost is very high, because those transistors actually, if you want to operate them at high speed, they need to be very big. Okay. Okay, so let's start with this uh, top down because we covered the bottom up very well, I think. Hopefully, now you agree that we, we have problems from the bottom that push us to have more intelligent controllers. Uh, let's talk about the top down. Basically, top down, what are the key system trends? Essentially, data access is a major bottleneck. And I've given you some examples. I'm, I'm gonna give you a little bit more examples. Applications are increasingly data hungry. And if you want to enable more applications like the bioinformatics that we talked about earlier, genome analysis, they're becoming even more data hungry than uh, we could imagine today. Uh, energy consumption is a key limiter. I think nobody can dispute that today. And data movement, energy dominates compute. I've given you some results. I'm gonna give you a little bit more results over here. This is especially true for off-chip to on-chip data movement. Uh, so the observation is that high latency and high energy is really caused by the data movement in the system. Um, basically, we're moving data across long energy hungry interconnects energy hungry electrical interfaces, the DRAM interface that we discussed, the analog interface is very energy hungry actually. And we're moving large amounts of data. It's not like we're moving small amounts of data, we're moving a lot of data. There's a lot of churn in the system. And that leads to high latency and high energy. So the opportunity is to minimize the data movement by performing uh, computation directly uh, near uh, uh, where data resides or exactly where the data resides. So this is where the terminology gets interesting, perhaps. So I call this uh, processing in memory in general. Of course, you could go more finer grain and say uh, there's a difference between processing in memory and processing near memory, like near data processing. I'm gonna use all of these interchangeably for now. Of course, there are uh, levels of this, right? You could be right at where the data is and you don't even move the data and you do operations on it. Of course, that could probably be the minimal data movement you could be a little bit farther away from the data. You do operations, uh, uh, for example, uh, around the subarray in the row buffers. You move the data to the subarray row buffers in that case. You could be a little bit outside. You could be somewhere else inside the DRAM chip around the bank. You could be a little bit more outside. 
close to the periphery. And then you could be outside the DRAM chip on the, uh, on the DIM, for example, you could add a buffer chip over there, that's another possibility. And then you could be outside uh, somewhere at the logic layer, assuming if you have 3D stacking. That's actually a little bit different from the uh, DIM. Uh, and then you could be even more outside, like you could be in the memory controller, and then you could be outside, you could be in the caches. But from the perspective of the caches, it's inside the caches, right? So, so this, this, that's why I don't want to uh, blur the terminology a lot over here. You, for example, you can design a cache uh, that can do computation with minimal data movement, right? Uh, an SRAM cache, it doesn't need to be DRAM. So essentially, we want to do this processing where the data is uh, and close to where the data is with as much as possible by minimizing the data movement. So I'm gonna call all of them, club all of that as in-memory computation or processing in-memory. And the general concept is applicable to any data storage and movement unit. So you could do it inside caches, SSDs, main memory, inside the network while the data is moving, for example, inside the controllers, inside the routers, anywhere essentially. And I think uh, looking at the system from this perspective can enable new opportunities because we're certainly not doing that today. We're basically moving everything, all of the data to the processor and the processor does something and then writes the data back or sends the data somewhere else. Okay, so we're basically, uh, in my opinion, we're gonna tackle the energy efficiency problem especially, but it's also true that we're gonna tackle the latency problem a little bit uh, because by being close to data, you're fundamentally reducing the latency as well. But there are other ways of reducing the latency as we will see next week. So I'm going to use Maslow again, uh, this hierarchy of needs. By the way, this is also used for political purpose <laughs> in the past. So he had a lot of influence beyond psychology. Uh, so I'm going, uh, before I said uh, here, the most important thing is reliability and security, right? But actually, if you look over here, it's not true. Yes, reliability and security is a basic need, but it's somewhere over here. The more important thing is, are you staying alive? <laughs> if you're not alive, if you don't have energy, you don't care about your reliability and security perhaps, right? So the real, maybe energy is even more fundamental than reliability and security. We could of course argue all of this forever, but we're not going to do that. So energy is very fundamental. So another way, view of this is, do you want a world that looks like this? I guess in Austria it's not bad, it just looks kind of like this. Uh, maybe I haven't seen the bad parts of Austria yet. <laughs> uh, but, or, or do you want a world that, look like, that looks like this? A part of the world that looks like this? Uh, so clearly we don't want this, I think. Uh, so uh, basically we want a sustainable future which requires energy efficiency, but we don't want to give up performance. How do we get all of them at the same time? Uh, the problem is, uh, so I think, uh, of course, the problem is much more general than computing, right? Uh, but computing power actually is increasing uh, if you look at the fraction of uh, uh, energy in the world that's consumed by computers. It's really increasing exponentially. All of these data centers that are being built are actually not great for human sustainability. Uh, maybe they're not the biggest fraction of things, currently, but they're, they're getting up there over time. Uh, so uh, what is the problem in terms of, uh, from the computing perspective? Basically, data access is the major performance energy bottleneck. I'll give you more results over here. But the way we, uh, uh, we uh, the current design principles that we use to design these computers essentially cause great energy waste because they lead to data movement all around the system. And it, they also cause great performance loss. I put this in parentheses over here because I think this is uh, much more fundamental uh, to data movement. Uh, why do I put it in parentheses? Bec uh, well, uh, we actually try to get rid of that performance loss as much as possible, right? In our processors, we add a lot of sophisticated complex mechanisms, heavy out of order execution, prefetching, huge cache hierarchies, many, many levels of cache hierarchies, many sophisticated cache control policies, uh, what else, a lot of multi-threading, especially in GPUs, for example, so that we can tolerate the long latencies of memory, so that we can tolerate the performance loss, essentially. Yet, I will show you that we still lose performance. But this is, uh, uh, beca because we put on all of those things, we actually cause even more energy waste, because all of that complexity we add to the system essentially cause even more uh, energy waste. Your devices become higher power. So it's basically a vicious cycle. You're removing a lot of data to tolerate the data movement. Uh, basically, by moving a lot of data, you're causing a lot of energy waste to tolerate the data movement latency. You put a lot of these mechanisms that are eating up even more energy. 
So I think this is really a vicious cycle that we need to break because this cycle will continue forever if we don't break it somehow. And the fundamental problem is that processing of data is really performed far away from the data today. Uh, and I think all of the machines that I know of actually do this. Uh, FPGAs try not to do this, but they still need to access memory, right? The, the data needs to be brought into the FPGA still. But inside the FPGA, you have memory and logic that are intertwined. So FPGAs are the closest units where you can, uh, you can repurpose memory as a computing unit today. You can have a lot of lookup tables, for example. Uh, but still, if, if people say FPGA is uh, doing something different, that's not necessarily true, except internally in the device. Okay, uh, so basically if you look at a computing system today, well, this is actually a seminal paper. How many of you have read this paper? This is where the von Neumann model was really introduced. Uh, it's a nice paper, it's an old style. Uh, but basically there are three key components to a system. Computation, communication, storage, and memory. And this is our cartoonish picture over here. And uh, if you look at a today's computing system, we're heavily optimizing this part, computing unit. We're essentially not optimizing any of these parts. Essentially, we're overwhelmingly processor-centric. And when I say processor, it also includes the accelerators. Accelerators are a special kind of processor that still is part of the computing unit. Essentially, all data is processed in the processor at great system cost. Uh, it's heavily optimized and it's considered the master. Everything else is really slaves. They're dumb slaves, if you will. Uh, they're largely unoptimized, except for the uh, storage units on the processor die. And even they are dumb slaves. They're there to store data but they're a little bit more optimized in terms of the policies that they employ. Yet, uh, as I told you, it's, uh, we know that it's really the memory. So I'm gonna give you the story very quickly again. If you remember, Dick Seitz wrote this paper, uh, one pager, and I would recommend that. That's not going to be the review paper because it's too easy to review, I think. Uh, basically, he, he and his team designed the fastest processor of its time, uh, which was supposed to retire, finish five, four instructions every cycle, but he wrote this paper saying, this processor is finishing one instruction every four cycles in the workflow that is designed for. So future processor design should really focus on memory subsystem. Okay, so that's 1996. And they designed it since 1993 or so. Fast forward 10 years. Uh, as I mentioned, this is my PhD thesis, uh, data from my PhD. We looked at all of uh, Intel's workflows that they were using uh, to design their processors with, and we found out that most of the time the processor is waiting for data. And this average across 147 workloads. Okay, you don't believe the site, you don't believe me, you can read the paper still to decide whether you believe or not. Uh, since everybody believes Google, I'll use data from Google. How many people believe Google here? I guess that's good. It's good to be skeptical, I think. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think this data is believable. Uh, based on what we've seen in the past also. This is basically a paper that was written by Google in ISCA 2015. It's a nice paper. It's an analysis of their data center workloads essentially. And they basically analyzed how much time is spent where in all of, in, in what they uh, claim to be all of their data center workloads. This includes a wide variety as you can see, ads, disk, whatever these are, Gmail, indexing, search, video. And they basically showed that most of the time, the processor is waiting for data. Only 10 to 20% of the time, the processor is finishing instructions. So these are high performance. This is, some, uh, I think it's Intel Skylake, for example, at the time. It's the high per highest performance processor that you can have in the general purpose space, right? And they're designed for high performance, yet they're waiting for data. So over the course of 20 years, 30 years, nothing has changed, basically. We're designing processors and they're still waiting for data. Even though performance has improved, they're still doing, most of the time they're doing nothing but waiting for data. So th this picture should make people think that there's something wrong with this picture, right? Because they're so, these are supposed to be computing, not waiting. Okay, so, and they, they do actual more analysis in the paper, so you can take a look at it. They also show that their workloads are much more intensive than some of the workloads that are used uh, in computer architecture research, for example. So this is interesting. Uh, these workloads are not as intensive as these. Okay, so basically we have a processor-centric design that leads to a grossly imbalanced system. That's why you see all of these reds waiting for data, right? Processing is done in only one place and everything else just stores and moves data. They're basically not intelligent. The data moves a lot as a result of this. And this is energy inefficient, low performance, and complex. 
uh, because now you increase the complexity in the processor a lot. And as a result, you actually have an overly complex and bloated processor and accelerators because you want to tolerate that data moment somehow. Uh, and to be able to do that, you add a lot of complex hierarchies and mechanisms that makes things even more energy inefficient. Low performance because you could have used all that real estate for something else, right? Uh, maybe security, right? But you're using it for to tolerate data access from memory, which actually also causes security problems. Like Meltdown and Spectre actually are really related to memory, right? They're really related to data moment and protection of memory. Uh, they're not related to an ad operation you're doing. Nobody really cares about an ad operation in the end. It's really about the data and its properties in memory. Uh, okay, uh, and also this is clearly complex, right? So basically, we're in this vicious cycle that I mentioned. And as a result, I showed you this picture early on. This is my XFIG drawing that I'm not going to change until the paradigm changes. So you draw it once, and you use it in all presentations for decades. <laughs> but I like this picture because it basically shows that uh, because of this design paradigm, most of the system is dedicated to storing and moving data. OK, energy perspective, I've given you the, that's the performance perspective. Uh, so energy perspective, I've given you this before. Now you can see the full picture over here. But basically, this is uh, old data borrowed from Bill Daly. They actually wrote a paper in 2011 also. Uh, I think it's called GPUs and the Future of Parallel Computing, something like that, uh, by Steve Kechter and others. They basically quantify the cost of data movements uh, in a GPU. Uh, and it's similar to what's shown here, basically. A 64-bit double precision floating point operation costs 20 picojoules. A DRM read or write costs 16 nanojoules, 800x. I take the liberty to make it three orders of magnitude. Okay, you don't believe three orders of magnitude, and I agree that three orders of magnitude is a lot, actually. There are systems where that, that this is true, or close to true, but existing systems actually try to optimize the memory interface more than what's written over here. Um, so if you look at an SOC, these are some of the most energy efficient systems of today, actually, uh, because they try to minimize the energy for obvious reasons, right? Um, basically, uh, it turns out there are a bunch of uh, works that are showing that uh, a memory access costs more than two orders of magnitude compared to uh, an ad. I was actually in the DAC conference uh, a couple of weeks ago and there was a session on specialized AI accelerators, machine learning accelerators, and people were showing some real data. And one of the uh, people over there showed uh, that uh, their memory access costs 160 times uh, the uh, complex floating point operation that they do. Uh, on the chip. So it's, it's in that ballpark, basically, two orders of magnitude, between two to three orders of magnitude difference. Even then, it's a lot, right? Actually, let me go back to this picture a little bit. Uh, if you, this is about three orders of magnitude today, right? Let's two orders of three orders of magnitude. If you go back 70 years ago, we had a different picture in terms of energy. Of course, it's a hard study to do, but computation was much more expensive at that time because we didn't have 70 years or some number of years of scaling of devices, right? Actually, this was about two orders of magnitude more expensive than memory access. So what happened over the course of 70 years is whatever remained on chips scaled really well. All of the Moore's law and Denard scaling enabled the reduction of energy for transistors. But the interconnects actually didn't scale really well. The interconnects uh, started being the energy bottleneck. And you have huge interconnects over here. And this interconnect is also huge, right? This is one nanojoules over here. If you want to communicate from here to here on chip, but it's still much larger than 20 picojoules. Basically, transistors, computation units scaled really well, but interconnects didn't scale well, and they're still not scaling well. As a result, over the course of 70 years, we moved from two orders of magnitude, com computation being two orders of magnitude more expensive to memory being two orders or three orders of magnitude more expensive. So basically, uh, this, I think, points out to the importance of interconnects. We need to find a solution to the interconnects. If you don't find a solution to energy-efficient data transfer, then we should uh, really uh, not transfer data across the interconnects. So another way of solving the problem, actually, is there's always this debate about, is it the memory, is it the interconnect? In my opinion, it's really uh, about moving data. And moving data can come from the uh, interconnect. So there, you're exercising the interconnects to move the data. And the memory is also dominated by the interconnect internally. Essentially, when you're moving data, you have to go through the interconnect. So it's the same problem, I think. You can solve the problem by me making memory more intelligent, or you can solve the problem by finding out, coming up with some technology that makes interconnects extremely energy efficient. 
I don't think anyone has that technology at this point. That's why making memory more intelligent and minimizing the data movement, minimizing the use of interconnects may be a better idea. Until someone comes up with a technology that makes these interconnects extremely efficient somehow. But I don't, uh, we'll see, I guess. Okay, so as a result, basically, uh, you get a picture like this. Most of the system energy is spent on data movement across the hierarchy. We're gonna cover this uh, paper later today. Basically, I think the takeaway of this is we do not want to move data. <laughs> we want to keep where the data is and we want to do computation as much as possible without moving data. So how do we do this? Basically, today we cannot do it. We don't have the interfaces, so we need to really ha uh, have a paradigm shift to enable computation with minimal data movement. Compute where it makes sense, where the data resides. This is not, uh, even though the title is in-memory computation, we're gonna look at a specific case of computing where it makes sense. But this doesn't mean that we should just compute in memory. Right? Sometimes it makes sense to compute in the processor, sometimes it makes sense to compute in the cache, sometimes it makes sense to compute in the SSD. I think we should have the option to be able to do the computation in all of those different components where the data may reside. And then we should figure out where, uh, how, how to do this, how to orchestrate this distributed system to do computation. Essentially, we want to distribute intelligence capability or co computation capability across all of the parts of a system as opposed to having only one option like today. And this means that we want to make computing architectures more data-centric. Basically, data is the uh, most important thing. As opposed to today, processor is the most important thing. Processors, we are processor-centric today. Actually, I think I have some other uh, slide that talks about data-centric architectures, what are the different properties. Certainly, minimizing data movement is one of the properties, but enabling low latency access, low energy access to data is another property. And these are not the same thing, necessarily, because if your data is so important, uh, you want to minimize the access latency to it, and you want to design your system such that you want to minimize the access latency to it. But as you know, the DRAM chip, its latency is not improving that much, right? So we're actually really doing the wrong things in the design of systems. We're not removing a lot of data. On top of that, the latency to access data and the energy to access data is actually very high. We're not designing for it. Okay, so what, uh, essentially you want to compute where it makes sense. So we're gonna examine computing uh, inside the memory here. A lot of the principles that we discussed will be applicable to non-volatile memory and cache, uh, SRAM caches also. Uh, our focus will be on DRAM, more, more or less in this particular lecture. Uh, but why, why do we focus on memory? Actually, when we first started looking at this, we were thinking, okay, we're, uh, we want to minimize data movement, what should we look at in research? Of course, you have limited resources in research, right? You cannot look at everything at the same time, even if you have a large group. Uh, and we wanted to focus on memory because I think memory is uh, very special. It's really hard to make it work in memory. You could put the computation inside the cache and that's a good thing. Making the cache intelligent is a good thing. People could explore that. But it's easier to do, right? For example, Intel can do it internally with some changes. Here in memory, uh, you could do it in the SSD. I don't show over here. It's also easier to do because SSDs have their own processors. You just need to have some offloading mechanisms and there are papers from Samsung, for example, that talks about that. This is a harder place, I think, because the interfaces that we have to memory, first of all, there's no processing capability at all over here. Uh, and processing capability is hard to add. And the interfaces we have to memory is really bad, actually. We don't have the hardware interfaces to talk to memory asking questions. We don't have the software interfaces to do any computation in memory, basically. So uh, this is a uh, harder place to do. That's why we focused on it. Uh, I was gonna say something else, but it escaped me very quickly. Okay, uh, maybe it'll come back to me. Okay, so what does it mean to uh, do processing inside memory? Essentially, uh, also memory is very important because actually uh, memory is a fast place to do and it stores a lot of data. That's what I was gonna say, actually. Uh, for example, people are developing in-memory databases and their goal is to actually fit the database to run from memory almost all the time, right? They're, they're beyond disks because disk latencies are too large. Right? That's why memory is also interesting because you can store a lot of data and you can access it fast. That's not true for caches. Caches, you can access it fast, but you cannot store a lot of data over there. Here you can store a lot of data here you can store a lot more data, but you, you don't have mechanisms to access it really fast. Okay, uh, so basically you have your data inside the memory, and we want to enable mechanisms to query memory 
ask questions to memory. Memory, can you execute this function on the data? And the memory can say yes or no. And if it executes, it returns the results. This requires clearly different interfaces. How do you design the memory to be able to do that? How do you design the controllers? How do you design the communication mechanisms? How do you design the processor chip and the in-memory units? How do you design the software and hardware interfaces? As I said, neither of them exists today. The hardware interface to memory is very, very primitive. Read, write, refresh, power manage somehow. How do you design the system software and languages on top of that? Because this requires support across the stack in the end. Because you need to be able to c communicate uh, what you're supposed to do uh, in the program uh, to the memory somehow. Compilers also actually play a role. Because how, how do you design the compiler to enable this? Uh, how do you design the algorithms? Once you have processing capability in memory, maybe the algorithms you design should be completely different. Right? And I will give you examples of uh, why they should be different. And also, I think there's a role in theory over here. I guess none of you are theoreticians here. But theory, if you look at the theory of computation, it's very processor-centric, implicitly. It counts operations, right? But it, it doesn't count a lot of memory. So maybe there is a different theory to be developed uh, once you actually have a completely different paradigm. I think theoreticians implicitly assume, knowingly or unknowingly, that everything is done in the processor. So we may need after different theory going forward. Uh, but I think that will have to come after uh, these things are enabled. So it's really an across the stack problem, basically. How do you design the devices? How do you design the logic? How do you design all of these intermediate things? And algorithms also need to change. I don't know if the nature of problem will change, but that remains to be seen. Probably not. Because everybody has some problems to solve, right, in the end. That's the goal of computing. OK, so I already said this, actually. Why today? Because there's a huge push from technology. We're having a lot of circuit level issues. And industry is actually open to new memory architectures today. They're not as closed-minded. As I said in the past, if you went to a DRAM manufacturer and said, I want just ECC in your memory, they would kick you out of the room. Today, they're trying to design things like this. Like, uh, actually, hybrid memory is one example. You have 3D stack logic layer uh, interconnected with high bandwidth connections, the memory layers. High bandwidth memory is an example of this. High bandwidth memory is actually used. HBM is used in GPUs today. Not necessarily fully 3D stacked right now, but it doesn't take much to make it 3D stacked. Uh, so another view of this basically is the connections. And Micron also has looked at more experimental chips that have very limited processing capability inside the row buffers over here. They can basically do deterministic finite automaton computation inside the chip. You could not imagine a major company doing this 10 years ago, for example. But today, people are experimenting with things. And on top of that, systems and applications are pushing us to do something different uh, with data movement, essentially. OK, now that said, now the motivation is completely done. Let's take a look at how we can do something different. As I said in the past, people wanted to put a complete processor inside the DRM chip. I don't think that's going to work easily. Actually, there are also startups that are looking at putting some processing capability inside the DRM, which is very interesting. I think in hot chips, some of them are presenting their work. I don't know if they will succeed, but this didn't exist 10 years ago again. Uh, but we're going to look at two different directions. Uh, one is very interesting. Surprisingly, no one has done this until we start looking into this. Now, actually, a lot of people are looking into this area. How do you minimally change memory chips such that, that you, can, you can do a lot of computation inside it? I was very surprised when, when my student, Vivek Seshadri, he did his thesis on this topic. Uh, and he wanted to look at prior work in this area, and turned out there wasn't much. Or maybe there's something in 1920s that we couldn't find, but I don't think there was a lot done in 1920s on this topic. Uh, so how do you minimally change the memory chips to uh, get a lot of value out of them? Value in, in terms of computation. So let's take a look at that first. And then we're going to look at 3D stack memory. There's another direction, like not minimally changing memory chips, but maybe changing memory chips at a medium level, putting some more extensive processing capability. Uh, I think that's also interesting, but I'm not going to talk about that. OK, so the first approach, I'm going to show you examples from DRAM. But the approach is actually applicable to many other types of memories. And some other types of memories are even more capable, because they can do better analog computation. Uh, so uh, any memory chip, including DRAM, has great capability to do bulk data movement and computation internally with very small changes. So basically, you can exploit internal connectivity inside the memory chip to move data from one bank to another, for example. I'll give you examples from one row to another. 
Or you can exploit the analog computation capability that's present in the DRAM chip. Or you can add slightly more computation capability. And maybe you can do even more uh, with little cost. I'm going to look at some of these examples. And initially, we're going to cheat. We're not even going to do computation. We're going to look at data movement, data copy and initialization. And this is done in many cases. For example, you copy a page to another page whenever you fork a process, uh, whenever you initialize uh, some large data structure, you basically write the same value into uh, the entire page, entire data structure. For example, when a database initializes, initialize actually takes a long time because it initializes the entire memory data structure to zeros, and you need to wait. Uh, but how do we handle these today? And people actually have analyzed this in the past. They said that this is a bottleneck in the systems. Like this is an old paper from 1990 that talks about uh, architectural support for operating systems. And people argue that operating systems are not getting as fast as, as fast as hardware because you don't have enough support from the hardware for this sort of primitive operations. And other people have looked at some support for block data movement and copying and initialization. You can take a look at those papers. So, but this is a very fundamental primitive, right? It's used in many applications. Uh, whenever you fork, you copy pages. There's copy on write, of course. You don't copy immediately. Uh, you share the page for some time between the two different threads, and whenever one writes to it, you copy the page, right? Uh, you initialize. This is important for security also. Whenever you're checkpointing, virtual machine cloning, deduplication, we may talk about that in a little bit. There are many applications of copy and initialization. And again, if you don't believe me, Google has recently written a paper, the same paper. Uh, they've analyzed all of their workloads, this is the same paper, and they showed that just mem move and mem copy. No other copy. There are many, many other copies in the system, of course, but just these two system calls consume 5% of the cycles. And that 5% is a lot, actually. Across many, many workloads, you get 5% on just these two function calls. So that's actually a lot. And they say this is part of the data center tax, and they say something should be done about it. And they actually reference the paper that I'm going to describe, saying that this is a good direction. Uh, memory should be able to do the copy internally. So how do we do the copy uh, today, in today's systems? Let's assume that we want to copy this white page to this gray page. What do we do? Well, basically, we go through the processes. Right? We bring this work page byte by byte all the way into the L1, the destination page byte by byte, do the copy, and then write back the destination page. Now, clearly, this is high latency because you need to bring a lot of data. Uh, and this high bandwidth utilization on perhaps one of the most important resources in the system, the memory bus. You cause cache pollution, but you could eliminate that actually by doing this copy through the DMA engine. You can set up the direct memory access engine in the, uh, uh, at the periphery of the chip such that it can actually do that uh, on its own. So you can actually bypass the cache hierarchy when you're doing the copy, but you still need to exercise this part. And you cause a lot of unwanted data movement. What if you're not going to use the destination page for a really long time, right? You're basically bringing all of these pages and then you're not going to use them. As a result, you're wasting a lot of bandwidth over here. And uh, essentially, if you actually do a four kilobyte copy, page copy, through the direct memory access engine, not even going through the caches, with some technology assumptions, it takes about 1,000 nanoseconds and 3.6 microjoules. This is DDR3, but DDR4 is not much better, actually. Uh, in fact, in some cases, DDR4 latency increases. Uh, but basically, that's the, uh, you, you waste a lot of time. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we had the option in the system, I'm not saying we should do all copies this way, but if we had the option to tell the memory controller, memory controller, do the copy internally like this inside the memory without bothering anything else in the system. Don't go through the processor base. This is low latency. I'm going to show you how to make it low latency internally because memory has nice internal connectivity. This is low bandwidth utilization. Actually, you don't consume any bandwidth except for say, telling memory, memory, do this. Uh, and no cache pollution, but you could eliminate that today by doing this through the DMA engine. And no unwanted data movement, essentially. If you're not going to reuse any of these pages, you're not disturbing anything. You're not moving any data. That's why I think you need to be careful. If you're going to reuse a lot, maybe it's, it's, it's fine to do the copy inside. So, but we don't have the option today. So I'm going to show you a mechanism that reduces that 1,000 nanoseconds to 90 nanoseconds in the best case, and 3.6 microjoules to 0.04 microjoules. You could optimize this to be lower, actually, 70 nanoseconds and a little bit less over here. And the idea is actually very simple. It's called row clone. Uh, and you've seen the subarray structure of DRMD4, right? This is a DRM subarray. 
this is uh, it consists of many rows, and these are the sense amplifiers of the robot. Assume that there are four kilobytes. There are alignment issues uh, that are tackled in the paper, uh, so you can find a lot of issues actually uh, if you if you're doing processing inside memory, but those need to be solved going forward. We're going to talk about the adoption issues later on, but assume that you have uh, two rows inside the same subarray. They happen to be inside the same subarray. How do you actually copy one row to another? You basically, uh, the idea is two activations, two consecutive activations. You first activate the, first, the source row, row A, brings the data into the row buffer. Essentially now the row buffer contains the data very strongly. Now the next step is to send and activate the DRAM which implicitly deactivates the source row, but the data of it stays in the row buffer. And once you activate the destination row, the row buffer gets connected to the destination cells, and row buffer drives the data that is captured into the destination. That's the idea. The first activate brings the data into the row buffer. The second activate brings the, takes the data in the row buffer and puts it into the destination row. Because of chart sharing principles, this is what happens. The first activate, uh, the sense amplifier sends the data. Before the second activate, they strongly store the data. And the second activate, once you activate this, the sense amplifiers drive the data that they have stored through the bit line because they have a very strong charge. In fact, if you, I'll give you some numbers. The size of a sense amplifier, single sense amplifier in today's DRAM chips is more than 100 times the size of a single DRAM cell. They're very strong and they have to be strong so that they can actually uh, get the data. Okay, so basically the idea is very simple. It's negligible hardware cost actually. You just need a couple of gates, uh, and even that, even those gates I don't think you need, but uh, to make the DR manufacturers happy. Basically you need, to, you need a couple of gates to ensure that the source and destination are in the same subway. So this is the best case you can get in DRAM as far as I, uh, I can tell. You have to move the data into the row buffer and then move it from the row buffer to a destination row. Because there's no way, whenever you read data in DRAM, you're destroying the data, right? You need to. Uh, there is some data movement you, sh you, sh you still need to do. So this works nicely if the source and destination are in the same subway. And the end result is uh, significant latency reduction for a four kilobyte copy and significant memory energy reduction, as you can see. More than 10x and more than 70x. So why does this work? Uh, let me actually go through this. Let's assume that this is the source row, one cell, destination row, one cell. Of course, there are four kilobytes over here. And this is a sense amplifier. Sense amplifier is big, as you can see. Initially, source row is uh, charged. This is reference voltage, this is also reference voltage. So this is, array is pre-charged right now. Now if you connect the source row to the bit line, this is what happens. Chart sharing, uh, this gets perturbed, sends some fire, detects the difference and amplifies the difference, and restores the cell. Because now sends some fire strong, it's driving the charge, it drives the charge back inside the cell. Now the sends some fire captured charge state and the value of the cell. Now the next step is deactivate this. Sense amplifier still stores this. You didn't pre-charge the array. And activate the destination row. Once you activate the destination row right now, what happens is sense amplifier drives this charge into the capacitor. And data essentially gets copied. So that's the copy of one. But you can copy uh, the discharge state also, which is essentially similar. Because sense amplifier is driving. OK, so that's the interest of array copy. Yeah. I'll go through this relatively quickly. Activate the source row, you activate the destination row. So this is the, the fastest you can get. But what if your data is in different banks? There are mechanisms internally into the DRAM chip to be able to do that also. There's a shared internal bus. What you can do is you can set the source bank into read mode and the destination bank into write mode and orchestrate the data moment this way. Memory control basically can do this relatively easily, assuming you have the mechanism to do this movement internal. It's very easy to add actually into a DRAM chip. It's not that hard. Because all of these communication mechanisms that exist, you just need to be able to set up such that this bank is being read while this bank is being written. That's it. And this is also not bad. Basically, it leads to about 2x two, two latency reduction and 3.2x energy, memory energy reduction for a 4 kilobyte copy. Of course, it's not the 11.6x or the 74x. So you're going out of uh, the bank even that reduces your benefits, as you can see, right? Okay, so this is uh, the second case. Uh, so basically, intra-subway copy is this way, interbank copy is as I described. The hardest part is really whenever you want to copy from uh, one subway to another subway in the same bank. 
it turns out there is no connection between these subarrays. Here, banks are connected through the same kernel, but here, there is really no connection. If you remember the subarray level parallelism, each subarray is connected to, to the bank I.O., but uh, the subarrays are not connected to each other. So what you need to do in this paper we propose, uh, you actually do interbank sub, uh, copy twice. Basically, you copy the row from this subarray to some other bank, a temporary place, and then from that temporary place to this subarray. Of course, this is not great. It reduces your benefits. It still buys you energy, but it doesn't buy you a lot of performance. So later on, we actually wrote a paper uh, in 2016 that enables the substrate to be able to do this better. Basically, the idea is very simple. You connect the subways with some interconnection. Very little cost. It enables much faster copying between the subways. That's great. But it also enables other benefits like reducing the latency. So it's really a, by increasing the connectivity between subways, you can, you can gain a lot of benefits at the same time. And assuming you don't do what I just said, but you do what this row chrome paper says, the area cost of the data moment uh, adding the support is actually very, very low. So, okay, I've talked about copying. Initialization is actually a special case of copy, right? If you want to initialize something to zeros, let's assume that you have a fixed row that's all zeros. It's not that hard to add into DRAM, actually. Uh, you lose some capacity, but you can actually play a lot of tricks if you're storing only zeros. Uh, and then you copy that row uh, to, uh, to the other rows in the subarray. And that way you can initialize data to zeros, for example. If you don't want to initialize to zeros, if you want to initialize some other value, what you do is you write that value to a row and then copy that row. Right? That's the idea. Of course, granularity of copy in this case is just at the row granularity. You don't have much choice in this case. So you need to operate at the row granularity. This is a bit different. This interbank copy, if you remember, you don't have to copy at the row granularity, right? Because the, the, the size of this bus is, the width of this bus is about 64 bits internally. Of course, it could change. Now you could actually do the copies at 64 bit granularity internally. So you, you could do fine grained copies. But if you're within a subarray, uh, within, uh, yeah, within a subarray, it, it becomes more expensive uh, to do the copies at a smaller granularity. It's a lot easier to copy an entire row to another row. If you want to copy only a portion of a row to a portion of the other row, then you need to inhibit the copy of the other parts. And it turns out you need to add a lot of internal muxes, for example, to be able to do that. And that's, that's a bit costly. Okay, so this is about initialization. I think I already said that. Uh, basically, this leads to 6x lower latency and 41x lower DRAM energy. And this is the overall benefits in the roll chrome paper. The, uh, the other paper, uh, so the, uh, the latency reduction is significant, as you can see. Uh, energy reduction is also significant, even more significant than latency reduction. Uh, this is zeroing, this is copying. Of course, now the uh, benefits that you get depend on where your source and destination roles are, right? And this is where things become interesting because ideally you would like to get the highest benefits. But if your data is not mapped nicely, you will not get the highest benefits. So it's really a system problem at this point. Who maps the data where? Right? And this is one of the adoption issues in processing in memory in general because if you want to process your data uh, inside the memory, you want to keep things relatively local. And whenever you're moving a source row to a destination row, you want both of them to be in the same subway. Who allocates them to the same subway? Whose responsibility is it? Is it the programmer? Is it the operating system? Is it the memory allocator? That remains to be seen, I think. But one of the issues that we have today is all of these, this information doesn't get exposed, not even to the memory controller, right? The memory controller doesn't even know the subways today. If you use subway level parallelism, that's a start. Uh, but essentially, uh, the, the mapping information, the internals of a chip needs to be exposed to the software so that somebody can do this mapping. I believe operating system is a good place to do this mapping. If the operating system is, for example, aware of the subarrays, or the memory allocation part, memory manager of the operating system, if it's aware of the subarrays, what it can do is whenever it's allocating a destination page, if you're doing copy on write, for example, whenever you're doing copy on write, you allocate the destination page from the same subarray. That way you can actually do the copy on write really fast. But of course, existing system designers do none of this. Operating systems actually, most operating systems don't even know where they're allocating a page in physical memory. They could know somewhat, but most operating systems are unaware of this. They, they have some NUMA support, non-uniform memory access support, but those are in different channels. Inside the same channel, they don't know anything, or they don't use the information they could know. 
So I think that mentality needs to change also. Uh, so it's, it's not, uh, this, the, the, you, you need to enable all of the infrastructure support to take advantage of uh, the benefits uh, like this. And the benefits are very heterogeneous, as you can see. You could argue that this is not a bad benefit, but it's not the benefit you want to get if you're changing the paradigm completely. Right? And in this case, we're not changing the paradigm completely. We just want to have copy functionality and zero, zero initialization functionality inside the memory. So this is actually the easiest to adopt thing, in my opinion. Uh, if I were a manufacturer, I would be doing it right away. And I hope somebody is doing it right now. OK. OK, and then all of this comes at very low cost temperature. And OK, so how does this affect real workloads? I'm going to go through this quickly. I don't want to make this a very evaluation-centric uh, thing. I'll give you some results once in a while. This is from the paper. Uh, basically. Uh, we look at applications that do a lot of copying and initialization, like system boots up as an example, an example compilation does a lot of zeroing, for example, forking. Whenever you fork processes, you actually do a lot of copying, copy on writes, and this is a shell. Okay, basically there are applications that do a lot of copying and initialization. They basically uh, a significant fraction of the memory traffic is because of that. And actually, if you convert those operations to row clone operations, you get significant performance. This is a performance improvement compared to baseline. It's really commensurate with the fraction of memory traffic uh, that is dedicated to, that is, uh, that is due to uh, copying and initialization. And that's true for the energy drive. This is memory energy. It's not the entire system energy, of course. But, uh, it's a memory energy reduction. OK. But I think this doesn't do justice uh, to uh, this picture, because what happens is, uh, actually, these workloads are copy intensive. But there are also other workloads that are copy intensive. For example, uh, if you're doing a lot of virtual machine uh, management. You re you're really doing a lot of copying of data actually around in the same system and across systems as well. This doesn't help the across systems of course, this helps the, in the same node. Uh, and wh what happens if you go, uh, go to a company like VMware for example, clearly they want to minimize that. They want to minimize the copying that they do. And they actually do minimize the copying that they do as much as possible. They do a lot of zero copy mechanisms for virtual machine management. But what they do is they actually complicate the software extremely to be able to do that. So if you look at the software stack, you don't understand the code at all. Basically, uh, they were they're supposed to do a simple copy, but that simple copy takes a lot of time. So they don't do it. They redesign the algorithm completely to avoid the copy as much as possible. And as a result, the software becomes very difficult to maintain. So there's another flip side to it. Maybe you don't see a lot of copies in some of the workloads, but if you have copy support that's extremely fast, people will go back to writing software much more simply. And they will just do the copy as opposed to jumping through hoops to write the software completely differently so that they don't do the copy. This is actually based on a real example. I spent some time at VMware and looked at a lot of code with people. And that's essentially what they do. They would uh, want the support. And there are many, many places I think this exists. If you're really performance conscious, and if you're designing a virtual machine, you have to be performance conscious. That's exactly why VMware succeeded, because they actually reduced the overheads of virtualization to very, very low levels. But they had to do this to reduce the overheads of virtualization. But maybe there's a very different way of designing the system that can reduce the overheads uh, a lot more. OK. So basically, this is, uh, even something like row clone requires some support end to end. Basically, application needs to somehow communicate the occurrences of bulk copy and initialization across the layers. Today, you may not be able to do that, actually, which means that you need to have some ISA, instruction set architecture support, right? In x86 today, we have that, actually. We're lucky. Uh, it turns out uh, the re uh, move, move instruction in x86, move s, you can add a repeat prefix in front of it. Basically, you can repeat it forever. You can do a move of a billion bytes in x86 with a single instruction. That's great. So that exists in some ISAs today. Uh, so this could be communicated today uh, in some ISAs, not all ISAs. I don't know how to do this in HIPS, for example. And I don't think ARM has any support for this sort of huge bulk data movement. But don't quote me on that, because I haven't looked at the latest ARM ISA. Uh, but MIPS, I'm sure that it does. <laughs> I don't know about RISC-V. Maybe you can check and <laughs> tell me. So clearly, that needs to be done. Once you do it, now you uh, somebody needs to uh, decide whether they do it using the VM or not. I think they're, they're all doable once it's expressed in the application. But there are some other issues over here which are related to adoption issues that we will talk about. How do you ensure cache coherence, for example? What if some of your data is already in the caches? What do you do with that? 
So this becomes a bit hairy. Uh, the paper uh, proposes that you flush the data first. But of course, there's a trade-off over here. Uh, so whenever you're doing data movement through the DMA engine, you flush the data also. So it's actually similar to how you're doing the data movement in DMA engine. So we know how to do this today relatively well. But there could be much more cheaper cache coherence mechanisms than just flushing all the data, right? And I, I, I encourage you to read the Rolfon paper if you're interested in this. But we have a paper coming up at ISCA that talks about the cache coherence support for uh, near-dig accelerators, like processing in memory. Uh, I think this is a fundamental problem. If you want to partition work between the CPU and uh, main memory, you really need to handle the coherence problem somehow. And you really want very efficient solutions for that. It's a bit different from the on-chip coherence because uh, if you need to ensure coherence on chip, you can exchange a lot of messages, right? Yes, it's not desirable, but on chip, energy cost is not bad. But if you are off chip, CPU and memory, and if you want to ensure coherence, every single time you need to ask the processor, can I use this data? That's bad, now you're causing data movement across the interconnect where you're supposed to be eliminating data movement. So coherence overhead actually is not, is not a good overhead in this case. And there needs to be more research, in my opinion, over here, for sure. So how do you maximize latency and energy savings? How do you map the data appropriately? This is really important. Uh, and I think, again, there needs to be more research in this, the data mapping problem. I think this is, I, I gave you a glimpse of it early on, right, when we talked about the backgrounds and memory. This data mapping problem is going to be bigger and bigger going into the future. And people actually deal with the data mapping problem in accelerators, right? GPUs, for example. If you want to get really high performance out of the GPUs, you need to map your data such that you don't get bank conflict. And GPU programmers. How many of you program GPUs here? So you may have noticed this. If you want to get high performance, you cannot just use a random data mapping, right? You need to map your data carefully, especially if you want to reach the peak performance of the GPU. So it's similar from that perspective, basically. You're doing some sort of computation inside the memory. You want to get the best out of it. Your data needs to be mapped nicely. But of course, GPU programmers would know that unless you're an expert in this, it's a bit painful. When you're an expert, it's probably not painful because you overcome this activation potential and you know how to do this really well. But that if you're not an expert, then it becomes painful. And most of the programmers are not experts. Uh, so if you want a new technology to be adopted uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the mainstream, you really need to help the non-experts with this. Okay, so how do you handle data reuse is another thing. Basically, data reuse means if Sometimes it's good to do this in the processor, sometimes it's good to do this in memory. So how do you figure that out? Again, who does this? There, there's also who does all of this, right? The, the question of who ensures cache coherence, who ensures this, who ensures this. You can punt on the programmer. Programmer, you're supposed to do all of this on your own. Good luck. Again, it's, that's not good for adoption, right? How do you handle data use? It would, be, it would be very nice to have a runtime system, for example, that handles this somehow. Again, I think a lot of the issues here that I'm discussing are similar to the issues that you would get on a GPU whenever you're partitioning a program between a CPU and a GPU. So it's not necessarily new. The difference is here, the movement of data is, I guess in the GPUs you have some off-chip data movements also. But now you don't have active memory. Now you, your memory is doing something, so there are some different trade-offs over here. Okay. Okay, I think I already showed you this, but let me move on. So this is the paper. Uh, and I'm going to, and as I said, I cheated over here. This is really not computation, right? This is data movement and initialization. But I think this is a really good place to start. It's very low overhead change for the memory companies. Uh, but uh, it, it, it gets a lot of benefits in these special cases where you get a lot of uh, benefit from moving data. So this is the mindset. I think this mindset, surprisingly, didn't exist until 2000. 12 when we first started uh, working on this actually. Actually, this paper was first rejected as well. <laughs> when we first submitted to ISCA, I think they rejected. I don't remember why they rejected. But <laughs> maybe it wasn't as well written uh, as, as the current version. Um, but basically, the mindset uh, that this paper brings is memory uh, should not be thought of something that's uh, not doing anything to the data. But we want to take advantage of what we can do really well inside the memory. That's the idea. We are designing all these accelerators that can do really well what, they can, what, what they're designed to do. But there's some stuff in memory that is really easy to do, and the memory is, the, is a great place to do it. So why don't we treat memory as an accelerator for those things? And that's the idea. So it's similar to a conventional accelerator. 
But of course, it's also very different from a conventional X ray in the sense that if you draw a boundary over here, the memory is sitting on the right side of the memory bus, whereas everything else is sitting on the left side of the memory bus. I would argue that this is really the correct side of the memory bus, right? Because now you have capability of acceleration here with huge, uh, with access to this huge capacity of memory, whereas you don't have that over here. You need to still manage the data movement for all of these accelerators. Okay, so that's the mindset, I think. Memory is really an accelerator that can do specialized operations. So then the question is, what, can, what else can you do in memory? And I'm gonna show you another example uh, that will essentially have a different computation model inside the memory. And uh, this is actually interesting because there are a lot of papers that actually look at adopting this for uh, new memory technologies also, and I really like all of those works. Uh, I think DRAM is also a good place to look uh, as, as we've shown earlier. So let me, basically we can support in the memory copy and zero. I'm gonna show you how can we support and or not and majority. And once you support and and not, you're functionally complete at that point, right? You can essentially do anything because that's the uh, premise of Boolean completeness. You can, you can express every computation as a circuit that uses an AND gate. And an AND is and a not, essentially. That's true for NOR also, right? But of course, you need to change your thinking and you need to ensure that your computations express that way to be able to. And uh, I'm gonna show you that we can do it at low cost. And the key idea is very simple again. We'd like to use the analog computation capability of DRAM. Yeah. Now, what does this mean? This means that if you activate multiple rows concurrently, it performs computation because of charge sharing in an ideal circuit. And uh, we'll get significant performance and energy improvements on these bitwise operations, block bitwise operations. And uh, this is the paper that reported it. And I'm proud to say that this was rejected four times before it was accepted. Or maybe five times, I don't remember. <laughs> I really like this, but people had really difficulty uh, accepting this. And, uh, and we kept getting this comment saying, this is a great idea, I love it. Uh, but DRM manufacturers will never do it. I think I mentioned this at some point <laughs> in this lecture. Uh, but DRM manufacturers will never do it. Uh, and we do reject. Basically, I think this is a really bad way of reviewing papers. Don't do it ever, please. <laughs> uh, because it's good to be open to these ideas. And it turns out this paper enabled a lot of other research, actually. We put it on archive first in 2015. Actually, there's an earlier paper that just does and and or uh, that we published before this. But we didn't know how to do not at that time. Uh, but this paper had a lot of impact because it enabled a lot of other research uh, in DRAM as well as other memory technologies to look into how to do these analog bitwise operations. And I think people are going to find out how to do it really well. Maybe, okay, at this point, DRAM manufacturers will not do it, but 10 years down the road, who knows, right? Uh, okay, so uh, I also put new memory technologies also. I think we did it in DRAM because DRAM, I think, is a very good place to start. But new memory technologies are also very, very interesting. They enable even more opportunities because uh, of multiple reasons. One reason is they can operate with minimal data movement because whenever in, in, in DRAM, whenever you access uh, a row, you destroy the data. Which means that you fundamentally need to move the data somewhere if you want to keep that data. There, you cannot get around that, basically. It's, uh, the technology is that way. Fundamentally, you need to move the data a little bit. But these other memory technologies, they don't destroy the data, right? Whenever you have, it's non-volatile. So you can keep the data, you can morph it to some other shape. Essentially, with analog operations, with uh, activating multiple word lines and bit lines, there are some crossbar operations. You could actually do a multiplication, for example. You could actually do addition. You could actually do NOR, XNOR, different types of operations in these technologies. And I think this is really, really interesting, for sure. Of course, the difficulty here is we don't understand these technologies as well. Uh, but we understand the yeah, much, much better. Uh, so if this works, it's easier to adopt. And I, I, I don't mean that this will not be easy to adopt, but we, this, these technologies require more development to really understand. For example, one of the issues uh, here that doesn't exist here is that because you're moving data and DRAM to the sense amplifiers, you're really converting analog to digital at some point. And that analog to digital to conversion is already there in DRAM. The sense amplifier does that for you. But in all of these technologies, you have the problem of at some point you need to convert from analog to digital and digital to analog and that doesn't exist a lot in these technologies. So they actually need to, especially if you want to do operations inside the array, you need to add a lot of analog digital converters. And that's the Achilles heel of a lot of these technologies. How to build a very good analog digital converter is going to be a big uh, uh, issue over here. 
So I'd be happy to recommend some papers related to this. I don't work in this area as much, but I follow the literature really well. Uh, and of course, we work on uh, phase change memory and other stuff for, from a different perspective, but not necessarily in computation or not. But I think it's really, really interesting to uh, see the space over here. But I think the good thing is once, if, if in-memory computation is enabled over here, uh, it's great, it's going to put more pressure on all of the other parts of the system to add more computation, perhaps DRAM, or perhaps DRAM would have added that by then. Okay, so let's take a look at it, uh, how, to, how to do the DRAM uh, very quickly. The idea is very simple. Assume it's an ideal circuit. Assume there are no variations or something, but the paper, of course, talks about the variations and uh, does simulations to check the variations. Uh, if you have three rows like this, uh, of course, think about these as rows, four kilobytes, eight kilobytes, whatever your row size is. Uh, if you had the primitive to concurrently activate these three rows, what would happen? In an ideal circuit, what you would get is you could concurrently activate these three things. If, you, if at least two of these cells are charged, you would get the charge state at the end. If, you, if at least two of them are discharged, you would get the discharge state. This is fundamental charge sharing principle, basically. You just perturb the charge, and if two of them are charged, two, two thirds of them drive the charge up, one third of them drive the charge down. As a result, uh, you get the VDD state over here. If three of them are charged, of course, you get the charge state. If three of them are discharged, you get the discharge state also. Essentially, what you have is a bitwise majority function. And that's the bitwise majority in Boolean. Now this is great because now you can convert your program into majority bitwise majority operations. And people actually do a lot of interesting work. If you know Knuth's chapter four, I think he talks about bitwise majority. This is the Art of Computing Crack Programming book, which you probably know. Uh, he talks about bitwise majority as a very, one of the fundamental functions that can enable a lot of operations. Uh, there's work from ETFL that actually uses bitwise majority functions to do logic synthesis. And they find that it's a very good function. Now this is great. You could do some bitwise majority across many bits. But the other realization is that you could easily rewrite this Boolean equation like this. Basically, you can set C to one. And once you do that, you get the OR of A and B. If you set C to zero, you get the end of A and B. That sounds great now, right? Because you can do bitwise AND or bitwise OR across rows. And you, could, you do it across, let's assume that your row size is eight kilobytes, you do it across all of the eight kilobytes in a subarray. You could do it in another subarray. You could do it in all subarrays in DRAM. Assuming you have a thousand subarrays, that's eight thousand times thousand, that's eight million bits that you're operating on concurrent. Of course, your power consumption will go up, but I mean, you're doing computation. You, could, you cannot assume that your power consumption will not go up, right? So you need to actually maybe cool your DRAM chip better going forward, but that's what that's the price you need to pay for doing computation inside the DRAM chip. So that's the idea over here. Basically, now you can have bitwise and uh, bitwise and bitwise or bitwise majority. And this is one example, like how we expose it to the higher levels. Again, just take this with a grain of salt, but this is a block hand operation. Uh, it basically performs a bitwise end of two rows A and B and stores the result in row C. So how do you do it? Uh, I'll go into a little bit more detail. I gave you the key idea. The rest is implementation. Basically, how do you implement it? Uh, it turns out it's, not, it's, it's very costly to enable this in the entire array. So we have a separate part of the subarray that's designated for just doing true flow activation. Because otherwise you need to have three row decoders that go to all parts of the subarray, and that's array expensive. We just want to have a separate decoder just for true flow activation that's really easy to design. So you have three designated rows, and then we reserve a row for zero, reserve a row for one in a subarray that's easy to do. So the first step is you have row A, you row clone it into one of the designated rows. You have row B, you row clone it into one of the designated rows. And then you row clone R0, which is the reserve zero because we're doing an end. You need to set C to zero. You row clone at D3. And then you do triple activation on these designated rows. Special, only, that's the only place in the subway you can do triple row activation. And now you have the result in all of the cells because of charge sharing. And then you row clone the result from any of these rows into the C. That's the idea. So this is the operation of sequence. So if you rely on row clone, you have to have this copy. Copy is a fundamental primitive because we c without copy, you cannot operate on data as we, uh, in DRAM, as we know. Uh, okay, that's the idea basically. And this turns out to be much faster uh, than a block bitwise and that you would do in the processor. And this was actually first introduced in this 
short paper. Uh, and we didn't know how to do knot. And the question is, how do you do knot? Well, the knot is that not as, not as easy, unfortunately. Uh, you cannot just do analog computation. Actually, the knot already exists. Uh, so this is uh, a particular row over here. Uh, but basically, if you look at the sense amplifier's other side, did I do something? I, th I thought I heard something. But basically, uh, this is bit line, and this is bit line bar. Bit line bar is essentially the complement of what you read right, from the cell. But unfortunately, this doesn't get connected anywhere in DRAM. You just operate on the bit line in DRAM. So if you were able to connect it to back into the array through a special row that we call the dual contact row, you can actually capture the knot. And that's essentially what we do. Of course, this is a bit not so great because it adds a little bit more circuitry into the DRAM because it doesn't exist in DRAM. I think there needs to be, uh, maybe there are other approaches to this. Actually, maybe you could connect it to the next array over here, which will be easier, but I'm not going to go into that right now. That's, that's good to think about. But actually, the key idea is very simple. Feed the negated value or complement that's already in the sense of fire into a special row. Now we have the complements captured in that row. Now that's easy to do the knot. And on top of that, you could do n. Now you can combine n, not, and you could do many sophisticated operations. I'm going to skip this, but this essentially shows how you do the knot operation in this paper that I discussed that. Maybe I'll assign this paper. I like this paper. OK. Um, this is, I'm going to skip this one. This is the performance. Basically, you get a lot of performance improvement. I think I'm going to have a summary of this. You get a lot of energy reduction in multiplied operations also. It can compound these operations, as you can see. And this is the summary, basically. Uh, the performance improvement, uh, on average, maybe whatever this average means, is about 30x. And uh, uh, energy reduction is about 30x, average across these operations, assuming those are all equal operations or equally weighted operations. Right? But clearly, you get much faster knots, fast enough and or. Uh, and once you start doing NAND, NOR, it's fast. XOR, XNOR, you don't need to do more AND, OR, and knots uh, to be able to XOR, XNOR. But actually, later, uh, there's work in the field uh, that came after this paper that figured out how to do some of these operations much faster than we did. So they actually, uh, you can take a look at some of those works. Uh, I, I believe there are some works that do XOR, XNOR much faster, for example, and probably NAND and OR as well. OK, so th the next question is, OK, we have a substrate that can do bulk bitwise operations. Let's assume that we can do 8 million bulk bitwise operations. Uh, we can operate on 8 million bits, and we can do uh, operations on those 8, billion, 8 million bits. Which application is best? I mean, this is a very general substrate, as I said. You could actually map any application to this, but some applications map better, clearly. If the application is already doing a lot of bulk bitwise operations, they're a very good fit for this. And we know that there are some applications that are doing this, like bitmap indices. Uh, if you have a bitmap index, actually similar to this one, for example, but, and you're operating on a lot of these bitmaps somehow, and these are used for database indexing, actually, it's a good fit. People have designed databases uh, to, to operate, uh, do searches or column scans on bit, uh, uh, using bitwise operations. And they, they did this so that GPUs are actually used in the database. Because GPUs are actually very good at doing the same operation on many pieces of data. And they're good at doing it on bitwise, uh, bit level also. So basically, uh, this bit weaving database is designed for a GPU. But it's a very good fit for this workload, uh, for, for Ambit also. Microsoft has designed, again, with a similar uh, reasoning, to do the web search on GPUs by using a lot of bitwise operations. Uh. DNA sequence mapping actually has a lot of bitwise operations. Uh, encryption algorithms, set operations, and there may be other applications also. So let me give you one example over here. This is uh, a bitmap index used in many databases. Basically, it's alternative to trees and its variants. And this is, these are very efficient for performing some range queries and joins. So you basically need many bitwise operations to perform a query. So one query, basically, you represent uh, your data like this. For example, uh, this is the bitmap of uh, people who are within this age. The bit where that particular row is set if that particular record uh, is uh, within that age range. Right? So I can imagine a lot of these bitmaps for age, for location, for where you were born, for what your job is. And you have a lot of these bitmaps. And then the next, uh, the query is essentially find all people who are within some age range 
uh, living in some place, are from some other place, and I don't know, uh, who are going to TUV or something like that, right? Now that leads to a query that does a lot of bitwise operations. You do a lot of ands on the ands, and you do a lot of ors on the or clauses that you have uh, in, the, in the query. It's actually a lot of bitwise operations because your database may be, I don't know, 10 million people, right? You're really doing 10 million ands, 10 million ors, and then you're compounding them. So, and their database becomes limited by how fast you can do these bitwise operations. And we ported this sort of workload to Ambit. Ambit is the name of the substrate uh, that I just described. And you get significant performance improvements. Essentially, this is five to 6.6x uh, uh, performance improvement in terms of the latency. And don't bother to, to understand these. You can read the paper for more detail, but basically it shows that your data set is increasing going from 8 million to 16 million users and going from uh, left to right in terms of weeks, your data set size is also increasing. So it shows that basically with larger data set, you're also getting better performance improvement. Okay, this is the uh, bit weaving database that was uh, designed by Zignesh Patel group doing something actually very similar to this, but the entire database is designed for that purpose. And we ported that database to Ambit, the NGM uh, uh, bulk bitwise en execution engine. And essentially you see significant performance improvements in query latencies for the entire database, in this case, four to 12 X. And again, as your data set size grows, uh, this is the number of bits per column, and also a row count over here, the performance improvement also grows. So that's a good chance to have your performance improvements increases as your data grows. Of course, for this to work, your data needs to be in the same memory module. Okay, and if you're interested, I recommend reading this short paper first, but the short paper doesn't have the knot and doesn't have the full evaluation. Uh, so you should really read the next paper, but I don't have the copy here. It's interesting. Okay, I don't have it over here. Anyway, I'll put it on the slides. But that's the Ambit paper that I mentioned. That's in Micro 2017. Okay, basically the key question after all of this I would ask is does memory really need to be dumb? <laughs> dumb meaning unable to do any operations. And I think this Ambit paper has changed the view on DRAM because this is, well, row clone also is another thing, but it's not doing operations, it's moving data movement. Uh, but it's, it, now it's uh, the barrier to entry to doing computation is relatively small. So key question is actually manufacturing it right now. So this is one example of minimizing data movement in DRAM. But, and as I said, emerging memory technologies have even more potential for this. So any questions? You guys are silent. Hopefully it's because it's very interesting and silent and not because it's very boring and you're silent. Okay. I'll assume that it's the first case. But feel free to ask questions. I mean, some of them actually, uh, there are a lot of questions to ask, but uh, Maybe I'll assign the Ambit paper as a reading. What do you think? I'll try to balance the papers, but the Ambit paper may be a good reading, uh, uh, a good review to do. Actually, we recently written a, a, a longer version of the Ambit paper talking about some future uh, directions uh, as an invited book chapter, but the book chapter is going to be published in 2020, but we couldn't wait until putting, uh, until we put the paper. So it's on archive. So you can search for NDM bot bitwise execution engine. I wrote it with my uh, PhD student, Vivek Sashadri, who, who's now at Microsoft Research India. Uh, so if you're really interested on some future research directions that we think are important here, you can take a look at that. It's called NDRAM Bot Bitwise Execution Engine. It's on archive. It's also on my webpage, so you can uh, find it. Okay, now let's switch gears a little bit. I think there is more to do in, uh, in DRAM. I, I, I keep seeing a lot of papers actually doing more in DRAM, which is great. And I think there will be more in this direction. But let's switch gears and look at some other way of handling processing in memory. Oh, there's the Ambit paper. That's out of order. That's a terrible out of order execution. <laughs> I don't know why, oh, I know why it happened. Uh, I know why it happened. It's really terrible, actually. So my computer uh, has, is unreliable. What happened yesterday was um, the up scroll and down scroll buttons are not working. So I'm pressing them right now, actually nothing is happening. Terrible. It's a very, I hope, I, I'm glad it's just those two buttons because if they were not two buttons, then I would have to switch to uh, my spare computer, which you should always carry with you in the 
these days is like this, especially if you have an old computer. But for example, left and right buttons are working, but up and down are not working. It's really annoying. Anyway, I should complain to Apple. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so the, the reason this happened was somehow these buttons went crazy and everything started scrolling and somehow this moved uh, to, apparently while I was working on this, this moved over here. Now I can reason about the, this thing. Okay, but that's the paper. Okay, now we're gonna exploit 3D stack metal. I'm gonna fix this, I hope, if the buttons don't go crazy again. If they do, now I have a spare. Okay, so here we're gonna talk about an opportunity. Uh, this is 3D stack memory. Uh, and uh, the idea is you have a logic layer underneath memory layers. And the logic layer is connected via fast high bandwidth connections, many of these, called two silicon vias. These are essentially not buses, but vias uh, that are wider than what you have uh, in a single layer, but they enable fast communication uh, between the logic layer and the memory layers. So that's the idea. Now we, we, we know how to design these chips with multiple layers. You can think of each of the memory like a DRAM chip, if you will, but the logic layer is able to have the controller inside and then you can put functionality uh, inside there. Uh, and of course, we're very high bank. And there are also other true three-dimensional technologies that are under development. This is a three-dimensional technology, but there are other technologies that are called monotic 3D uh, that try to make these vias even smaller, actually, much, much smaller. Uh, they use some new technologies like carbon, uh, carbon nanotubes, which are very, very interesting, I think. One of the examples of that is the next project at Stanford. They're a little bit down the road, I think. They're not gonna happen immediately. This is already there. But those technologies are very interesting for enabling uh, in-memory computing also. And I believe they will have their place uh, once they happen. Uh, okay, so this is interesting because this already exists and uh, as you can see, this is the Ramulator paper, the star simulator uh, that I was going to talk about, but I will defer the talking about it. Essentially, when we wrote that paper in 2015, there were already a lot of technologies that are 3D stacked, or that could be 3D stacked. So HPM, for example, right now is in GPU. HFT, we'll see how its development goes. But wide IO technologies were low power, uh, and Intel had this uh, MCD ARM technology that they specialized. Uh, so these are all very interesting technologies, and they're already there. And if you want to know more about the implications of these technologies, I mentioned our Sigmetrics paper that looking, looking at the workloads, interactions with different technologies, we cover a lot of these technologies in that work. Okay, uh, basically, uh, when we first started looking at 3D stack processing in memory, what can we do in the logic layer? We had two big questions. One is, what are the performance and energy benefits of using 3D stack memory as a coarse grained accelerator? if we had the freedom to change the entire system. We basically want to use uh, processing capable in the logic layer, but we have the freedom to change everything in the system, including coherence, including programming model. Basically, uh, sky is the limit over here. And it's good to do these studies. And then we, uh, I'm gonna show you results with that. Or we don't have the freedom to change the entire system, but we can offload simple functions from the processor to this 3D stack map. I'm gonna talk about that also. And then we also had the opposite view, which is we have this 3D stack memory. What is the minimal thing that we can do with it without changing the system much? And this is, I think, very important for adoption going forward. And we wanted to examine that question also. So with minimal changes to the system and the programming, what can we achieve? So let's start with the first one over here. We're gradually going to uh, have less performance benefit as we go from here to here, basically. Less performance and energy benefit. So let's start with the first one changing the entire system. And when we, uh, of course, when you change the entire system, it's good to focus on a workload uh, because otherwise it's going to be very difficult to do the studies. And uh, we wanted to basically focus on uh, the processing of graphs, graph analytics essentially. And graph processing, large graphs are essentially everywhere. Uh, these are some examples that you may or may not know of. Uh, whenever I give this talk at Facebook, I, uh, they tell me that I'm wrong Apparently they have 2.33 billion users or something like that. Uh, but I put the circa 2015 over here so that they cannot tell me that I'm wrong. <laughs> and I don't want to change that number, as you can see. Uh, 
So essentially, large graphs are everywhere. Uh, this is example. So bioinformatics also operates on large graphs uh, today. Uh, machine learning frameworks. A lot of machine learning frameworks are graph based underneath. Actually, the problem is if you want to work on large graphs, uh, scalable large graph processing is challenging. So uh, this is one example from PageRank. PageRank is uh, the algorithm that's used for a lot of web searches. Uh, essentially, if you put cores, uh, if you add more cores to the system you don't get much benefits. And you get a lot of energy cost clear. Why? Well, I'll go through this relatively quickly, but basically uh, the core of the algorithms usually have frequent random memory accesses because there is, if you look at a graph, uh, the, the neighboring nodes usually don't have, uh, uh, essentially are different uh, in different places from each other in memory. As a result, you get frequent random memory accesses, and you have a little amount of computation on the graph also. You usually don't do a lot of computation. There are cases where you do a lot of computation, but that's not most of the graphs graph traversal. Most of the graph traversal is no computation almost, very little computation. And uh, uh, this is a very good forecasting in memory, clearly, because you're doing a lot of memory accesses, little amount of computation. You're really exercising the bottleneck of memory in this case. So if you wanted to design a scalable system to do this graph processing, uh, although in the end we end up with a system that's more general purpose, but somewhat specialized for graph processing. And I'm going to give you the high level picture first. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because it's really a full system design uh, that is based on 3D stack memory. And this may be another paper that I will recommend. I will think about some of the papers and I will send you an email in terms of which ones to review. But I like this one because this is really a full system design. Of course it's in simulation because we didn't have this technology at hand, otherwise you could have built it. And even though the technology existed, uh, there were no mechanisms to actually do what we're going to do to the technology. So you have logic layer over here, memory layers. Uh, but uh, let's look in internally inside the chip. Well, before we look internally, essentially the system that we're designing is an accelerator for graph processing. It's uh, connected to a host processor with some interface, very much similar to a GPU. You offload graph computation over here and graph computation happens inside uh, the logic layers. And what do we do in the logic layer? Basically, if you look at the logic layer, uh, it consists of what is called these vaults. These vaults, each of, uh, it's basically partition. Each partition has a memory controller and a network interface, so the partitions can communicate with each other. And the memory controller controls the memory on top of it. And memory is also a port partition. Assume that there are 64 of these, you have 64 partitions over here and 64 memory controllers. And there's a network with which these memory controllers are connected to each other with through the network interface. So what we add to this is very simple in-order cores. Essentially, this is a general purpose system because this in-order core can actually execute anything. But it's very simple in-order cores. We don't want to make things complicated. There's no complicated out-of-order execution because this logic layer could be very high quality, actually. But one of the issues with the, uh, the 3D stacking is, uh, as I said earlier, if you generate too much heat, Heat has nowhere to escape, basically. Or you need to come up with new cooling mechanisms. Even if you come up with cooling mechanisms, this is harder to cool compared to a two-dimensional system that where you don't have another layer, another layer on the same, uh, on the processing unit, essentially. So we wanted to keep it simple and realistic. Uh, so the, the, also the area, you have limited area over here. And if you want to put a lot of these, uh, your area of the in-order core needs to be small. Essentially, we have these in-order cores. You have a lot of in-order cores over here. And you map the graph in the uh, memory layers. And uh, instead of moving the data, a graph node, to a core that requests it, we're going to move the computation to the node that houses the data. So uh, if you look at the bigger picture, uh, you may fit your graph on top of this, but that will be a small graph because your memory limited in the end. Uh, the size of this is limited. So if you want a scalable system, you interconnect a bunch of these 3D stack lit logic plus memory chips. And then somebody does the graph partitioning. Somebody maps the graph nodes on top of these chips and then on top of these vaults. And graph nodes stay constant. They don't move, at least in this initial incarnation. Later, people have built on this and they basically showed you can move the graph nodes and get better performance. And I agree with that. But this is the initial incarnation. Um, basically, somebody maps the graph nodes uh, on the memory layers. And the idea is, if you want to do computation on that node, on that graph node, you send a message to the core that houses the memory that contains that graph node. 
So you never move the graph nodes. Graph nodes stay uh, constant. You always move the messages to the nodes. And that's the idea. So this is essentially a message passing engine. There is no coherence because the data doesn't get moved. The data stays constant. So the, it's the programmer's responsibility to send the messages to the right nodes so that the data gets operated on. And that's the idea. Uh, because we're not doing a lot of computation, we're actually reducing the data movement significantly because of this. Uh, as I said, communications are done via remote function calls. That's essentially message passing. This is very similar to how a lot of distributed systems are programmed today. So we know how to do this actually at the distributed system level. And this is essentially a distributed system internally. Uh, what else am I? This also actually, if you're, if you're familiar with the old 1980s machines, how many of you know about the J machine, for example? Nobody. I guess it's too old now. So J machine was a design. Uh, it was a design by Bill Daly, actually. It was a parallel computer. It had actually a very similar structure like this. It was message passing based. Uh, uh, so you would communicate. It, it was a scalable engine. And I would recommend reading the paper. Uh, they built it. They showed a lot of performance benefits. But it didn't do processing inside the memory. Basically, it did, uh, the difference of this is it, it has similarities to those old machines, but this does processing inside the memory. So it reduces the data movement a lot more. The go their goal over there was to how, how to achieve scalable parallel processing. So we borrow from those machines to achieve scalable processing, but uh, our benefits actually come from processing in memory mostly. Okay. So basically, you communicate remote function calls. What does that mean? Essentially, you don't do this. Uh, now, uh, the, the data uh, is somewhere else in some vault. You basically send a function to be executed in the vault that, pause, uh, that houses the data that you're supposed to operate on. And you send also the input uh, that you're going to add. That's the idea, basically. You, you use these put function calls uh, yeah, to, to uh, send messages to some other vault. And of course, uh, if a node may be putting a lot of function calls to some other nodes. Yeah, so you need to have some programming model that ensures that programmers don't go crazy, right? Basically, when do you ensure that, when do you wait for those messages is one question. In this case, it's a non-blocking blocking remote function calls, meaning that the processor sends a function call, remote function call, but it doesn't block. It keeps continuing executing the code. And we add a barrier over here to ensure that we don't, we wait for all of those function calls that we started uh, before the barrier. That's the idea. There's also a blocking version of this function call that's described in the paper, you, and it depends on how you actually uh, program the machine. So okay, there are a bunch of stuff. Uh, you send a function, you send a value that's to be added, and you send the address of the node that's in the remote core, and this is the function. This is what the function is supposed to do, basically. Uh, you, you add the arguments uh, to the uh, data that's inside here, and then you accumulate it inside the data, uh, inside somewhere, basically. Of course, this is a very simple function. You could add, you can add, send more complicated functions clearly. So this is what a remote procedure call looks like. You need to send the function pointer, you need to send the arguments, and you need to send whatever it's needed to execute the function clearly. And the paper has a lot more detail on this, but this part of the paper is really not that new. We know how to do remote function calls, except it's a remote function call on chip, right? Or, or not necessarily just on chip, but uh, well, in the memory controller, let's say. Okay. So we also add some prefetching mechanism. It turns out if you have these in-order cores uh, that are underneath uh, the logic layer, it uh, in, in underneath the memory layers, it turns out these high, uh, the high bandwidth connections provide a lot of bandwidth. And if you have simple in-order cores, they don't saturate that bandwidth. And we found that out. Uh, uh, you have all of this bandwidth and we're not using it. So we added prefetching mechanism to use that bandwidth. And prefetching is a much better way of using that bandwidth compared to building a much uh, bigger out of order execution core and much more power efficient way. And it turns out you can do very good prefetching in some of the graph workloads. And uh, one of the prefetching mechanisms is message, message trigger prefetching. While your messages are waiting over here, you can trigger prefetches for them. So this is very important for performance actually because now you can utilize the bandwidth that's available to you. So there are a lot of other design decisions in this paper. I would recommend you to read it. It's a system architecture co-design completely. Uh, I'm not going to go into that, but I'm going to give you some results. So these were the comparison systems that we evaluated. This is DDR3, hybrid memory cube, hybrid memory cube with many cores. So you can see the bandwidth numbers, 100 gigabytes per second, about 600 gigabytes per second over here. 
And the difference between here and here is this is 32 out of order cores. This is 512 in order cores. Because we have in order cores, we wanted to compare to the in order cores over here also. Uh, and we have 512 in order cores exactly actually in our system. And if you look at Tesseract, that's the name of our system, that's a three dimensional hypercube. That's what Tesseract means. Essentially, the bandwidth that you are exposing the cores to is much higher than what you would get over here. It's eight terabytes per second in that day's technology numbers. And that day is actually really 2013, even though the papers published that 2000, in 2015. So you can imagine there's another story in terms of the publication of this paper. Maybe I'll tell you the story very quickly, I guess. I guess the, this paper was supposed to be accepted in a conference, Micro 2014. But uh, there, were, there was something really stupid that uh, they enforced in that conference. I was a program committee member, and they enforced, even though the paper was well above the bar, uh, I already had two papers accepted to that conference, so they didn't accept this one. <laughs> you can see there's, so there, there, there are issues that are not merit-based in my opinion. I think everything should be merit-based, that's my perspective, but this paper didn't get in because this was not, the process was not fully merit-based. But it doesn't matter, it got into, a pretty good conference and it has added its impact. But basically these things happen, just don't give up in terms of your big ideas, for sure. Uh, okay, anyway, uh, if you look over here, uh, the, mm, you can see that this is a different system, right? Here you, the processor memory dichotomy exists. As a result, you're pin limited, your bandwidth limited. Here that dichotomy doesn't exist. 3D stacking ensures that you're not pin limited and you get higher bandwidth. That's why this looks different. And that's why this looks, I think, more beautiful because you don't have this rigid dichotomy, right? Okay, so what are the performance benefits? The paper has a lot more analysis. It looks at graph partitioning also, for example, and graph partitioning improves the performance even more uh, if you do intelligent partitioning. Uh, but on five graph processing algorithms that are commonly used, you get significant performance improvement. If you don't do prefetching, you get about 9x performance improvement. If you do prefetching, you improve it by a lot. You get about 13 to 14x. This is average across five algorithms. And I think this is good, but this may not be the best because we didn't really fully optimize the system. There is a lot to optimize in a system like this, and we didn't really fully eliminate all of the bottlenecks. I believe if you actually optimize this even more, uh, you may actually be able to go to 30x, maybe 50x if you actually add some more mechanism. So it's actually very promising, I think. Uh, that's an order of magnitude uh, on average across important workloads. And I believe you can do more. So let's take a look at why do I believe that you could optimize it more. Uh, basically, these are the bandwidth consumption numbers. This is the memory bandwidth consumed, terabytes per second. Uh, well, I guess these are gigabytes per second, but the, the scale is terabytes per second. So you can see that we're consuming 2.9 terabytes per second. But the peak bandwidth is really 8 terabytes per second. So our efficiency is 3 out of 8 almost. So we're not actually utilizing the 8 terabytes per second bandwidth yet. That, that's why I think there is room for improvement in this system. If you look at the baseline system, it's 80 gigabytes per second. Its peak bandwidth is 104 gigabytes per second. So its efficiency is much higher in terms of bandwidth, eight out of 10. So the baseline system in, in, has better bandwidth efficiency in that sense. So I think we can actually improve the performance even more over here. And you can see that prefetching actually doubles the bandwidth consumption, more than doubles the bandwidth consumption. It doesn't more than double the performance, which means that prefetching is not very efficient also. So maybe there are other ways of improving the performance in this system. So it's always good to look at these numbers and see how much bandwidth you're consuming or wasting. So in this case, if you're doubling the uh, bandwidth, more than doubling the bandwidth, but not more than doubling the performance, then your prefetching is probably not very efficient. But I think we wanted to construct a proof of concept system. So for a proof of concept system, I think the numbers are looking pretty good. And then we also have analysis in terms of like where are the benefits really coming from. Uh, so here, this is hybrid memory cube. And in this case, we basically add the same bandwidth to the hybrid memory cube system without changing the programming model and programs. You get some benefit, as you can see, 2.3x. And this is without prefetching. This is on a special work, uh, a subset of the workloads. So you get about 2.3x. So bandwidth is buying you part of the benefit, but it's not all of the benefit. On top of that, if you change the programming model, you get a lot more, basically. So some of the benefit is coming from the additional bandwidth that you're exposing the programs to, but a lot of the benefit on top of that is coming from changing the program to take advantage of the uh, substrate. And you can also do it the other way around. This is Tesseract plus conventional bandwidth. This is hybrid memory cube uh, plus conventional bandwidth. 
So Tesseract itself going from here to here might be about 3x. And if you improve the bandwidth on top of that, you get about 6.5x, which is about 2. Point, I guess 2.15 uh, or something like that, 2.16 actually, which is about close to 2.3. So the benefits you're getting from bandwidth is about 2. Point something x. So it's really bandwidth plus the programming models. And when I say programming models, so all of the other changes that we do to the system so that the program is uh, operating on data uh, by, by, by moving the uh, computation to the data. OK. OK, what about energy? Well, energy results are also good. You can see that this is uh, about 8x energy reduction. And all, this also doesn't improve. It doesn't include the cores inside the baseline machine because the baseline machine cores are actually very energy inefficient. We didn't want to bias the results. It's actually more than this, I think, if you optimize the system. So the results look pretty promising, actually. Uh, and I think, uh, as I said, there are many works that built on this work. Uh, later, people figured out that there's still communication. So uh, one of the downsides of this work is if you want to scale, you really need to ensure that your graph nodes that are communicating with each other are within the same uh, hybrid memory cube, right, within the same chip. Because if you go across chips, then you go into the bandwidth bottleneck again. Other works actually try to optimize that, for example. But let's look at uh, the advantages and disadvantages. So it's a specialized graph processing accelerator using PIM. As far as I know, this is the first one that takes advantage of uh, processing in memory. Now you can see that there are large system performance and energy benefits. Uh, and it takes advantage of 3D stacks for an important workload. And I think this is the first systematic study, as far as I know, again, uh, of using a 3D stacked uh, memory system for a, 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 a reasonably sized workload. That's important. And I think it's more general than just graph processing because there's nothing special in the in-order cores. You can actually do machine learning on top of this, but maybe you need to specialize your in-order core for some, to do machine learning very efficiently. So it's, it's really applicable uh, beyond graph processing, although we did look at just graph processing. But of course it has disadvantages. One is it changed a lot in the system, right? We really get rid of coherence, for example. We have a completely different programming model that some people may not be used to. Uh, it's not shared memory anymore. Right? Uh, and we have specialized Tesseract cores, somewhat specialized. Also, cost is an issue, clearly, because these are 3D stack memories, and 3D stack memories are actually usually more costly. And uh, as I said when I started the slide, scalability is limited by the off-chip links or the graph partitioning. Basically, you need to do good graph partitioning to get even better performance on top of this. And later works actually focused on that, and you can probably find those works uh, online. And that's the paper. This may be another paper that I will assign. So I guess I'll take a vote here. Who wants this paper? Who wants to read this paper? Only one person? Two? Oh, OK, I see more hands now. Who, who has already read this paper? OK, no one. I should probably ask that question also, because if you already read it, I'm not going to assign it. <laughs> OK, who wants to read the AMBIT paper? That's the bulk tripwise operation. OK, I see more hands for some reason. Who has already read the AMBIT paper? To be honest, that's OK. <laughs> OK, no one. OK, maybe I'll assign both then. I find both of these directions exciting. They're completely different, of course, right, as you can see. And they, they lead to completely different design choices in the end. So we'll see which one I will assign. Maybe I'll assign both. Really, a majority voted for both. Okay, so now let's look at uh, something else. I think this is a good direction to follow by changing the entire system. There are other works in the field right now, especially building on Tesseract. Uh, and it's good to look at that direction very well. Uh, but let's look at also a more realistic or more shorter term directions, let's say. Uh, then we wanted to look at what functions can we offload to memory to get as much benefit as possible. And I'm going to give you a, a several works. Not in the chronological order, but in some other order. I'm going to talk about this work that we've done because we actually spent uh, almost two years on this work. I spent some time at Google. My student, Amirali, spent even more time at Google and also uh, after Google uh, to analyze the workloads, build the infrastructure to figure out uh, what's going on in these workloads. That infrastructure didn't exist, and certainly the processing and memory evaluation didn't exist. And we wanted to essentially understand uh, the data movement bottlenecks in uh, these consumer devices. Because I think these consumer devices are really the most energy limited devices that we have today. I mean, there are other devices that are coming up that could benefit from processing in memory. Like if you have Microsoft HoloLens, for example, if you put stuff in your head, you don't want uh, that to be exploding because of heat, right? So th there you have even more energy constraints. Um, 
and they're limited very much by data moments also over there. So maybe that will be looked at later, but this is something you could look at more easily for sure. And clearly energy consumption is a first class concern in these devices. And you wanted to understand the energy consumption in some key workloads. And these are some key workloads a lot of people use them clearly. And they're actually uh, part of Google's infrastructure clearly, but this uh, nothing special, special about Google. They have counterparts over here also, except we couldn't work with these counterparts, right? This is an iPhone. <laughs> That's why we couldn't work with these counterparts, right? But these are more, more or less open. Uh, okay, so we're gonna look at uh, a couple, uh, some of these. I'm gonna, uh, first of all, the major conclusions. This is energy cost of data moment. We wanted to understand the energy cost of data moment in the system. And we, our first key observation is that on average, across all of those workloads, with realistic input sets, as realistic as we could get, uh, more than 60% of the total system energy is spent on the data moment. So this is, I think, a terrible result in the sense that 60% is pretty high. Uh, and the potential solution we want to examine is uh, moving computation close to data so that we minimize that data moment. But the challenge in a system like this is uh, you have limited area and energy budget. So you cannot actually put a lot of uh, energy into those compute units nor you can put area. So in the paper, we consider those very seriously. So the key question is then, what do you put into those PIM units? Let's call them PIM units, processing and memory units. So the second key observation in this work is a significant fraction of the data moments often come from simple functions, like copying, initialization. I'm gonna give you some more. They're, they're not as simple as copying, but they're going to be relatively simple. Uh, and the key idea is to design lightweight logic to implement these simple functions in memory. What does it mean to implement lightweight logic? So one lightweight logic is more general purpose, small embedded low power core. Another one is more small fixed function accelerators. And again, your logic layer can be, in my opinion, a best logic layer is a reconfigurable subtrade. You have reconfigurable subtrade in the logic layer. You figure out what part of your program is a bottleneck. You just instantiate it over there nicely. And that's your accelerator now. And then you can reconfigure it dynamically. I think that's the best substrate you can have. In this case, we look at something like this, although we don't take into account all the reconfiguration overhead because we want to examine that uh, workflow. So it turns out uh, offloading to PIM logic reduces energy and improves performance by around 2x by carefully selecting these functions. So 55% reduction means that you are, you're reducing 55% uh, or 54% Execution time reduction means that you're actually improving performance by 2x. This is not written very well, sorry. We're looking at everything in terms of execution time and you're reducing execution time by half. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at some of these workloads. Uh, I guess I'll focus on Chrome a little bit. This is very interesting because everybody uses it. And this is how Chrome actually renders a web page. You get the input over here and then you go through all of these render uh, processes which I'm not going to go into in detail. You can read the paper for more detail. I'm gonna go over this relatively quickly. But basically you first load the page and parse it, and then you lay out the page, which calculates the visual elements and position of each object. Uh, and then you do the painting, you paint those objects and generate the bitmap. Sometimes you do it on GPU, sometimes you do it on CPU actually, uh, in this case. Uh, and then you assemble all layers into a final screen image whenever you're doing this uh, rendering of the web page. So basically, uh, what do you want uh, in a system? Basically, if you want to satisfy user experience, the browser must provide fast loading on these web pages, smooth scrolling, and quick switching between the tabs. And I don't know about uh, you, but I always have 50 tabs or so in my uh, browser, and it's usually slow. <laughs> Maybe that's why my screens, uh, the, the keys died, I don't know. Anyway. So we basically focused on two important user interaction, page scrolling and tab switching, and both of them include page loading actually. Page loading is really the user experience limiter here. So what happens during tab switching? Uh, if you look at Chrome, we, and if you focus on Chrome for obvious, obvious reasons here, it employs a multi-process architecture. Each tab is a separate process. And uh, there are two main operations during tab switching. You context switch and you load the new page. And the memory consumption is a big issue. Actually, primary concerns during tab switching is uh, one of the primary concerns is memory consumption, and the second is, of course, how fast the new tab loads and becomes interactive to the user. And Chrome uses memory compression to reduce each tab memory footprint so that you can actually put uh, many tabs in the system. And this is actually a memory limited uh, device. Even that's a memory limited device, but this is even more memory limited. Uh, so what you do is an inactive tab gets compressed in memory in what's called ZRAM, 
And uh, whenever you want to load a tab and use it, you need to decompress that tab. So we want to study the data moment. And the, uh, basically, we emulate a user switching from to 50 tabs in this case. And there are three key observations. Compression and decompression contribute to a lot of the system energy. 18% is high, I think. And a lot of data actually moves from between CPU and memory. ZRAM is a special compressed area of memory. So the key question we ask is, can we use PIM to mitigate the cost? So this is exactly what you do today with CPU. You swap out the end pages, and then they're uncompressed. Uh, and uh, basically, you compress them whenever you're swapping out, and you write them back to memory. That's the idea. And then you move to other tabs. So there's high data moments over here. So if you actually have CPU plus PIM, you swap out the M pages, you do all of that in memory. Basically, do the compression in the logic layer. This is a very good function to put into the logic layer. And there's no off-chip data moment while you're doing this part. And you can switch to other tasks also in this case. At least that particular thread context can switch to other tasks. And it turns out, actually, uh, it's feasible to implement in-memory compression and decompression in the PIM core and PIM accelerator. Accelerator is, of course, better, as you will see in the results. OK, I think I already said this. Basically, a large amount of data moves when you're doing compression and decompression. And both functions can be implemented in PIM. Now, OK, well, I don't know why this is animated. But that's one example over here, compression and decompression. And this is actually a very general function. There are many, many workloads that could benefit from compression and decompression. Chrome is just one example. Let's take a look at this one also. Um, I think this is maybe more exciting today because there, everybody talks about machine learning, right? And this is one of the more popular machine learning frameworks. How many of you work on machine learning here? OK, that side of the room. No, nobody on this side. Okay. So I think TensorFlow, we want to analyze TensorFlow. And actually, in mobile devices, you d use this TensorFlow framework to do inference. And inference is essentially using, uh, done, is done using neural networks. Uh, you basically uh, give a prediction uh, for a classification task, for example. And it turns out that even though this consumes a lot of energy and performance, uh, I don't know why that happened. Let me see. Yeah, this is a simple data reorganization operation that uh, requires simple arithmetic. Basically, you're basically uh, changing the layout of the matrix. It's, it's, it's not a lot of arithmetic. Quantization is very similar. Basically, almost all networks that I know of, in fact, all networks that I know of, they don't operate on huge amounts of data. You know, the input data may be 32-bit floating point. They convert it into some small amount of data. They quantize the data, basically, because they want to save execution time and energy consumption. And there are a lot of works in machine learning that look at the effect of this quantization on accuracy, for example, and everybody, uh, all of the, a lot of those work argue that you should really do this for fast execution time and energy. For training, you may need these big data, but even training uh, of the network, uh, people try to reduce the size of that data today. In fact, uh, the extreme case of this is really binary neural networks. You take a big amount of data and you represent it as zero or one. And now you can operate uh, on just one bit per data element. And that makes things more efficient. And you can imagine that that one bit representation is a great fit for m bit, right? the bitwise operations. It's a great fit for m bit. And people are trying to make those binarized or binary neural networks the common case today. It's not there yet. But because the data that they need to operate on is very little, just one bit per data element, uh, they're trying hard to get the accuracy levels high. But once that succeeds, I think Ambit could be a very good substrate for uh, actually uh, accelerating. But I think basically the key point here is quantization <coughs> is done to uh, improve performance as well as en energy consumption. And while you're doing this quantization, you're moving data a lot, essentially. It, 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 actually, the majority of quantization energy comes from data moments. And it's, uh, the system spends a lot of the inference energy and execution time on the quantization also. Of course, this depends on how much data you have, big networks, spend a lot of time to quantize. And it turns out this is a simple data conversion operation that requires shift, addition, and multiplication. And this is, again, very easy to implement in uh, logic layer. So let's take a look at uh, what we get. Yeah, I already said this. OK, we evaluate this with a simulator. Um, we actually had to build a big simulation infrastructure. We, we, we get a lot of real data from real systems and feed it to the simulator also. Clearly, we didn't have the system. Uh, that exists. So let me give you the key results over here. This is the normalized energy. It's normalized to doing the operation in the CPU only uh, versus doing it in the PIM core versus doing it in the specialized accelerator and processing in memory. 
And you can see the functions that we offer. And these are functions that, after studying the workload for a long time, under, uh, we understood that these are the functions that are good to offer. And you, you don't want to offload functions that are not good to offer. For example, in TensorFlow Mobile, we didn't offload the matrix multiplication operations. Those are very heavy computation operations. And there's no reason to actually uh, send them to, uh, to memory. At least the way we're doing processing in memory. In the logic layer, you don't get a lot of benefit, basically. It's, it's a lot better to do it in the processor with a lot of units. It's, it's better, a lot better to do it in the accelerator, machine learning accelerator, that's specialized for that purpose. Uh, okay, so we offer the packing and quantization, for example. And video uh, motion estimation, for example, that's one of the hardest things to offload, actually, uh, and a bunch of other stuff that's specific to video. That's why I believe that a reconfigurable logic layer is a good idea, because clearly you're not going to put all of these accelerators uh, in, a, in a single chip and build an ASIC logic layer out of that. But if you have a reconfigurable layer, you can instantiate these accelerators whenever you need them. Okay, and the, the results are, as I, sh uh, as I mentioned, basically you uh, cut down energy by half. And of course, uh, the accelerators are much more efficient. As you can see, the accelerator bars are lower than the uh, core bars because accelerators are specialized for doing the operation. So for example, a comp decompression accelerator is much fast, uh, much more energy efficient than a core that's used to do compression, decompression. And those are the results, basically. Okay. And there's a lot more results in the paper if you're interested, I could recommend that also. And this is the runtime, the performance benefits. You can see that the energy benefits of a core are actually higher. The performance benefits are not that high for the core. But once you move to accelerators, you actually gain the performance benefits also. Essentially, your performance is about uh, 2x. The ex runtime reduces by half. Your performance improves by 2x in this case. And that's the idea. And for the analysis, there is a lot more analysis in the paper. The interesting thing to see for me here is the cores, OK, they don't buy a lot of performance here, as you can see. But once you make it a specialized accelerator, you get a lot more performance for motion estimation, for example. On the other hand, there are some cases where you buy a lot of performance. Texture tiling, for example. You buy a lot of performance with a core also. So this is the interesting part about specialization. Whereas energy, you get a lot of energy benefits just with a simple in-order core also. You don't need to specialize the accelerator uh, that much, as you can see over here. Because most of the energy is, again, because of data movement. Whereas performance is a bit different. Performance is not completely dominated by the data movement, but also how efficiently you can execute these operations. In the CPU, you use out-of-order cores. Here, you move to in-order cores. You're actually not as efficient, but now if you accelerate these, you get more efficient. Okay, so that's the idea. Any questions? Is this interesting? Who wants to read this paper? Okay, some people want to read every paper, which is good. <laughs> yeah, this is more recent, as you can see, and this is more limited compared to Tesseract, but I think this is a very important study to do also. And who knows, maybe other scientists also. But you can independently read all of these papers of here on your own as well. So let me actually talk about some of the other work that we did even before this one. Uh, we also wanted to see the benefits of this in GPUs. And GPUs are actually very interesting also because they're very much limited by uh, the memory bandwidth. So for example, here we have a main GPU and we have different memory stacks. And we actually added simple GPUs over here in the memory stacks that are not as capable as the main GPU, not as powerful, because again, you're limited by the thermal and the area limitations over here. But data moment tasks can be, uh, data intensive tasks can be offloaded over here. And here, we did something very interesting, basically. We wanted to make it easy to program. We made it completely transparent. Basically, we uh, designed a compiler pass where the compiler figures out which part of the GPU program uh, is, would benefit uh, for, from acceleration in a system like this, basically would benefit from being uh, shipped to the logic layer. And I think there are good heuristics inside here. It's not an easy task because it's completely transparent. The compiler doesn't change the program at all. And if you do that, I think the good thing is the programmer doesn't need to do anything clearly. But the bad thing is you don't get as much performance benefit, as much energy benefit because you're limited as to what you can offload. And it turns out you get 30 to 50% performance improvement if you do this, which is not bad, but clearly it's not 2x, like what we did with the Google workloads. 
But I think this is a very good direction to follow uh, to, to make things adoptable going into the future. And we have some other work that I'm not going to talk about over here. And uh, there's also this work which is really interesting, which is basically offloading pointer chasing. How much time do we have, by the way? Are we already over? Should we keep going? What do you think? Until 2.30? Or we can start pick up next week as well. Who wants to keep going? <laughs> I see your hands. Who wants to stop? That's okay, don't be shy. I won't be offended. <laughs> it's actually very hot right now here. But okay, I'll keep going at, uh, until 2.30 and then we'll stop. How does that sound? Because I think we're in the middle of something really interesting. I don't think I'm going to finish everything, that's unfortunate, but maybe we'll pick up in some interesting part. So the site thing very interesting also, basically uh, pointer chasing is done in many applications and we wanted to look at how to do it. Uh, and this is also a very difficult part of the workflow to improve, right? You have linked data structure accesses. And we wanted to extract inside memory and there are multiple challenges. How do you supply the parallelism and how do you do the address translation? Uh, and this is actually a big challenge. Like if you actually have virtual memory, you do the address translation on the CPU. But if you actually offload something to uh, memory, how do you do the address translation over there and access protection? So you really need virtual memory functionality inside the memory as well, but how do you design it becomes a, a problem. And this is one of the adoption challenges. Uh, and our solution was an accelerator which uses some address access decoupling idea to enable parallelism. I'll talk about that very briefly. This is very similar to decoupled access execute idea if you're familiar with it. If you're not, you'll see it. Uh, and the other is basically a low cost page table in the logic layer. Right? Uh, I think the virtual memory system needs to be completely rethought with new memory technologies. But in this case, we don't do a lot of rethinking, but we adapt the existing system. But I think virtual memory that we have, as we have today, is a huge bottleneck in the systems. A lot of systems suffer from the virtual memory address translation. Uh, GPUs, for example, is one example. We have a lot of work on how to enable virtual memory for GPUs, and it's a mess, in my opinion. You need to do a lot of te uh, techniques. Uh, and if you have a lot of memory anyway, do you really need all of that address translation capability is another question, right? The virtual memory was designed uh, at times where we had little memory. Today we have a lot of memory. Maybe we can get away with not translating sometimes, right? We need to still support uh, security, I think, access pr uh, protection, but that's a different function of virtual memory. I think it can still support protection in ways without, uh, that doesn't require a lot of translation. Okay, anyway, basically, if you're stuck with virtual memory, uh, how do you actually do it on the memory side? In this case, basically, we see significant speed up for pointer chasing operation, and we actually, a lot of databases do link data structure traversal, so we actually see significant database throughput improvements also. And there's also significant energy consumption reduction. Again, this is a 3G stack logic layer uh, plus memory. Let me give you the key ideas very quickly. Uh, essentially, this is a hard problem. Actually, uh, in my thesis, I worked on linked data structures a little bit also. So I worked on tolerating long memory latencies by parallelizing memory accesses. That's the idea of runhead execution. But you cannot parallelize memory accesses that where one access, uh, the address of one access is dependent on the previous one. And this is fundamentally a problem with linked data structures. But it's used in many, many workflows. Right? These are some examples. And these data structures are connected by pointers. And traversing these linked data structures, it requires changing the pointer. So this is one example. You want to find element A in this tree. You basically need to send the address of the first node, get the data of the first node, check if it's A, and then it's not A, so you figure out where to go. You have to send the address of the next node, get the data of the next node, check if it's A, and then move on. You send the address of the next node, get the data, and then check if it's A, in, the, in this case A, and you're done, right? That's the traverse. That's a lot of round trips to memory, as you can see. So the memory latency bottleneck is exercised in this one. So you have a serialized and irregular access pattern, and in, a, in real workflows, we find that this uh, pointer chasing part of the code actually is much slower than other parts of the code. Six times uh, cycles per instruction compared to other parts of the code. So our goal was to accelerate pointer chasing inside main memory because we're close to data, we can put the acceleration mechanism over here, and the CPU basically says find A, and the logic layer does, oh, sorry, find A, and 
logic layer does all of that traverse internally and sends the data. That's much nicer, right? Somebody else's problem, not CPU's problem. And that somebody else is the logic layer. So there are multiple challenges here. Very quickly, I'll go through one of them. So if you actually design an accelerator over here, you need to be careful. And we want to design an accelerator. So a CPU core, this is how it does basically. You, you do some computation, memory access, computation, memory access. That's how it goes. In memory accelerator, memory access is shorter over there. That's great. So you're faster for one operation. But if you're not careful, you may have multiple traversals coming from different CPU cores. And CPU overlaps those independent traversals. Maybe you're accessing different parts of the database, for example. Uh, but if you have a simple memory accelerator that doesn't have parallelism, you basically serialize uh, those traversals. So you actually can do the wrong thing on the memory side. It can be slower for two operations. So the key question is how do you solve this? There are multiple solution directions. Uh, because accelerator is shared by many of these CPU cores, uh, uh, you, you, you need to actually accommodate that parallel. The opportunity is that a pointer to an accelerator still spends a long time waiting for memory. Basically, memory access is still a lot longer than computation. And the R solution is actually address access decoupling. CPU cores send these different accesses, and address engine, so we divide the accelerator into two, address engine and an access engine. An address engine essentially does the computation, access engine does the memory access. And now you can pipeline the computation and memory access as you can see. You start the memory access, you start the next memory access by communicating between the access, access engines. The address engine keeps doing computation that's sent to it from the CPU cores and communicates with the access engine to start the memory accesses. That's the idea. And then there's of course back communication coming from the access engine to the address engine and the hope is that you're much faster again because your memory access are uh, faster, closer to memory, and hopefully you're even more energy efficient because you're not moving data all the way into the CPU. And that's the idea basically. Uh, so this idea actually, I don't know if you're familiar with the decoupled access and execute idea. How many people are familiar with that? This is Jim Smith's work in 1982 or so. And he basically proposed that we design general purpose processors, like accelerators, uh, very similar. You have an access processor and an execute processor, and you decouple the program such that access operations go here, execute operations go here, and these two communicate with each other via queues. And he said that basically you can scale those queues with very large sizes, and then access engine can, uh, execute engine can go ahead compared to the memory engine because memory may be slower. And sometimes the other way around may ha also happen, depending on the bottlenecks in your program. This way you get out of order execution, limited out of order execution without building a completely out of order execution engine. I think it's a pretty cool idea. And this is one incarnation of the idea uh, also. It's called Decoupled Access Execute Architectures, 1982 ISCA, if you're interested in that, Jim Smith. Uh, okay, I already said this. So this core architecture is, I've already given you basically, you have an address engine, access engine, and it's very similar to the architecture developed by Jim Smith. There's an access queue, there's a response queue. You can make these queues as large as possible because queues don't consume a lot of power, right? Because it's, it's first in, first out. Uh, you just need to manage pointers. You don't need to search these queues in their entirety. Today, a big problem with the out of order engines is that you're searching big queues. Uh, not big queues, you're searching big data structures. These are real queues. And then we add a cache also, of course. There's some locality over here. And then there's a request queue. Well, so let me show you how things happen. Basically, you, you get a traversal from the CPU pipeline with it, you get the next traversal. The first traversal goes to the access engine, uh, finishes address engine and goes to the access engine. The second traversal also does that in a pipeline manner. Oh, I think I skipped some animation. These animations are tricky. Okay, traversal one goes to DRAM and traversal two, two does the same thing. And then basically traversal one returns and traversal two also returns. Basically you pipeline a lot of these traversals such that there is no bottleneck in the system. Okay, the second challenge, the address translation. Essentially, the challenges actually exist in all of the processing in memory uh, systems. I'm wondering if there's someone in this room. Anyway, I guess they'll, they'll come and kick us out, right? There's someone. Okay, so basically, this exists in all processing in memory systems. That's why this is very fundamental. The, uh, the previous challenge is specific to what we were looking at, but here, this pro problem needs to be solved somehow going into the future, and it's an open problem. Basically, you get a pointer, you translate it, 
And in existing systems, you do a huge pace table block, which is excited by the TLDs today, of course. But if you don't, if you get a TLD miss, you need to do this pace table block, real. Which basically requires going through many pace tables to do the address translation. And then you get the physical address, and then you access memory. So how do you do that on the memory side, basically? There's no pace table, no TLD, no MMU on the memory side, essentially. And one way is to say duplicate it, right? Do the exact same thing that you do in the CPU, duplicate it over here. Okay, you could do it, yes, but it's costly, right? And also, it creates one other issue. Assuming this is your memory, now you're tying your memory to a particular page table implementation or page table specification, right? And every ISA, every instruction set architecture has its own page table. ARM's page table is different from Alpha's, different from x86, different from Spark, whatever ISA you're using. RISC-V is, uh, is also different. So it's a big mess. You don't want to necessarily burn a lot of area for all of the potential page tables that you can use. So how do you solve this problem? And this is a very fundamental problem. I don't think the solution that's in this paper works for all systems. It works for, I believe, uh, this particular case, maybe. So the problem is the page table walk requires multiple memory accesses. Uh, and our solution is completely decoupling the page table uh, from the page table of the CPU. And essentially, the idea is this. You have virtual address space, physical address space, CPU page table maps the entire virtual address space to the physical address space. So you have this mapping. Uh, that's the CPU page table. On the Impica side, Impica is our accelerator. On the memory side, it basically we limit the page table. We basically say, if you're going to operate in memory, you'd better map your pages to this region, to this part of the virtual memory, essentially. And if you're going to operate on uh, the memory side, just map them appropriately, such that only this part gets translated by Impica. It's a solution. I don't think it's the greatest solution, but it's a solution. But I'm not sure if there's a greatest solution for a virtual memory problem. If you're really interested in solving a very hard problem, I think this is a very hard problem. Or rethinking virtual memory completely in today's systems is a hard problem also. Basically, that's the idea over here. Map linked data structure into Impica regions. And Impica page table is now a simpler page table. Why is it simpler? Basically, uh, you have a smaller region, essentially, to deal with. And this is the design of the page table. It's not as complicated because you're not really mapping the entire virtual memory address space. You're ma mapping a smaller part of the virtual memory address space to, uh, to, and storing the translation, of course. And you, all, uh, you basically have a very small region table because that's the region that you're mapping. And that tiny region table is almost always in the cache, uh, it turns out. And, this, uh, and you have flat page table. I'm not going to go through this in detail. You can read the paper. Uh, you can actually download the code and test it also via open source. Uh, this code. Uh, and essentially, uh, again, we use a full system simulator to be able to do this. Uh, so let's take a look at the performance improvements. These are actually improvements on benchmarks that or workloads that are hard to improve the performance of because people have actually tried a lot of interesting tricks on the processor side, like prefetching mechanisms, try to parallelize these, but in the end, you're bottlenecked by dependencies. These are, these are the worst uh, workloads, in my opinion. So linked list, for example, if you add extra cache, you don't gain much compared to the baseline. It, it's still 1.0, as, as you can see. So we use extra 128 kilobytes because our estimation is that Impica consumes that amount of area. Uh, so you can see that uh, with the linked list uh, benchmark, you get about 90% performance improvement. And performance improvements reduce as the benchmark becomes more complicated. Speed tree traversal are, of course, hard, but 20% is not bad for these workloads, actually. So we also map the database, uh, I think DBX1000. It's not written here, but we mapped it. So in this case, database benefits from the extra L2, actually. Uh, if you give it one megabyte L2, database benefits even more, because there are parts of the database that are not uh, doing linked list traversal, and those parts actually benefit from the extra space that you give it the L2 cache. But in PICA, it actually gives you overall better performance. It's about 16% in terms of throughput. And we also look at latency. Again, database benefits from extra L2. But again, uh, doing this acceleration on the memory side actually buys you uh, even more performance. We also look at energy consumption. Again, as expected, the linked list workload is the simplest workload, so that you get a lot of energy reduction over here. 
And uh, in the database, database is very complicated. There are a lot of, and this is overall system energy. It's not just memory energy. Uh, you get uh, about 6% reduction in energy, which is not bad overall, if you look at the overall system energy. And what is the cost of all of this? Basically, this is what you add into the, uh, this is a, for comparison. Basically, this is a, a, an ARM processor. It consumes that, that much area. And this is the area that's consumed by NPICA, about 0.45 millimeters square. It's less than a megacalorie, which is good. And it's less than an L2 cache, as you can see. But the power overhead, always, whenever you're doing computation in memory, your power overhead increases. So you need to take that into account. No question about that. The computation doesn't come for free. Because you're adding units over there, you need, you need to add power, you need to add cooling overhead. OK, so let me give you a few more, and then we'll be done, basically. And then we're not going to be able to complete this lecture, but that's OK. <laughs> OK, so there are actually really interesting things. Uh, this is logic layer, as you can see, a very hard application. We also looked at doing processing inside the memory controller, not on the memory side, but on the CPU side. Uh, this work actually looks at that. This actually, this work actually does something that's really hard, in my opinion. Uh, it automatically finds out which parts of the program are doing dependent cache misses and automatically ships them to the memory controller. And the memory controller has the capability to execute those parts, completely transparent to the uh, programmer. Uh, and it shows a lot of performance benefit because now you're, uh, you're not going to uh, the memory controller, uh, you're not going through the cache hierarchy to do these dependent cache miss traversals. It targets a very similar problem, linked data structure traversal, but takes a very different approach, basically. Analyzing the code internally with some hardware structures, automatically find out what parts, uh, what you should ship to the memory controller. It's not easy, there's a lot of hardware complexity that goes into it. The hardware here is much more complex than the hardware that we've described over here, because everything is automatic. But I like this uh, idea also because it's very interesting. It is, uh, aside from the complexity, it's doable in existing technology because it doesn't require any special memory in this case. You just ship things to the memory controller that's already on chip without any programmer effort. Okay. Uh, actually, there's another work that's related to this that is not here. Maybe, maybe my computer deleted it. Anyway. This is probably a good place to stop, what do you think? No, I, I, I was going to cover this part, but I think we can leave it uh, for Monday, because it's also very important, but we already had more than four hours of lecture. And I'm not tired, but maybe you're tired. Okay, so let's start, uh, yeah? You wanted to have more hours of lecture? <laughs> okay, or you have a question? Okay, are there any questions? to anything we discussed? Why are people hungry? I guess people are hungry. Oh, okay. I forgot that we, there was a lunch in between. But I didn't schedule these, actually. I don't know how these are scheduled. I didn't pick these lecture times, frankly. Maybe these are scheduled based on the availability of the room or something. I assume you didn't have anything to do with the scheduling of these also, right? Yeah, I don't know how, what's the algorithm that's used. Okay, so let's stop here then. And um, so I think what I'll try to do today is send you some papers that I think are good to review. I'll take into account all of the votes also. These are required reviews. You don't have to do them right away, of course, as we discussed initially. Uh, you can delay them. But if you do it earlier, the better, of course, because you can pipeline them as opposed to uh, process them in one chunk rate. And have a good weekend. I'll see you Monday. <laughs>